Good morning to those of you who are just joining us. For those of you who have been there a while, I'm sorry you've heard me speak quite a lot, but we're going to be starting in just a minute or two now with the conference. Um, so please just hang on and we'll be starting soon. Good morning and, and hello to those of you who are joining us this morning for the Complete Careers Conference, Outstanding Careers Provision, Managing the Cost. As it's 9.30, we're going to get started and I'm going to take you through some little bits of housekeeping before the speakers really begin. So I just want to introduce myself. My name's Jenny Beaumont, previously long staff, and I'm Business Development Manager at Complete Careers. I'm also a guidance professional and involved heavily in the Career Mark Award Quality and Career Standard. So I may know some of you already. Just to talk to you a little bit about the morning and what to expect. These are the conference outcomes. Um, and by the end of the conference, we really hope that you have received an update on existing and emerging research and policy with a focus on the careers leader practitioner's time and the limits and associated costs. We are very conscious around the issues with regards to maintaining and managing your workload as a careers leader. And we're very familiar with many of the challenges that you face. We're hoping that you're going to be introduced to some really practical solutions to share the workload and responsibility in your organisation. So careers leaders can't possibly work as an island. We're going to talk more effectively about how you can really think about spreading that workload. And we hope you've had the opportunity to review free and costed support to develop your careers provision. So thinking about which with the money that you have, what you can possibly invest in and make um, the best possible use of. So just to move on to a few little bits um, about us as an organisation. Um, Complete Careers, as you may know, you may be very familiar with us or fairly new to, to working with us. Um, but we are a limited liability partnership which was formed in 2015. We are small, but we like to think that we have a big reach and that we are trying as much as possible to influence um, the careers landscape. We're career specialists with more than 60 years combined partner experience. This is just amongst the partners. We have significant amounts of experience and historic experience in terms of what good careers looks like and supporting schools and colleges to develop effective careers provision. We're recognised providers of career CPD, accredited training in QA, and we deliver on the level six career development apprenticeship. And we're really thrilled to have a really healthy cohort for our second lot of um, learners moving through that now. We're also still careers guidance pro service providers, and we uh, are still delivering a lot of guidance. I was in schools yesterday delivering guidance. We're delivering a lot of guidance still to schools um, in our local area, um, face to face and then sometimes remote. We understand very much the challenges that guidance professionals are facing and, and the shortages of guidance professionals um, across the country. We're also a national licensed awarding body for the quality and careers standard. So a lot of the work that we do is working with schools across the country, even sometimes across the world, helping them to quality assure and understand the strengths and weaknesses of their provision and help them to develop um, strategies for moving forward. And we're also authors of a series of resources to support careers programmes. And this is something we really enjoy being involved with. And some of those um, resources, Bonkers Book of Jobs is, 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 is down there below, but we are increasingly getting involved in a lot of resource projects to support organisations with resources to help teachers, careers leaders in school, and also directly to help, to help learners themselves. 
So just before I hand over to our first speaker, I just want to take you through some of the, the conference etiquette and expectations. So the first thing to say is please just be patient with us. We're a fairly small organization. If you have any issues, please do um, call the office or contact us at admin at complete-careers.com and we'll get back to you if you're having any technical issues, but please do have patience with us. We're working hard in the background to make sure that everybody is in and engaged. Just to say that this um, is being mm. recorded, <clears throat> so please be aware of that. And it will then be uploaded to the website. So if you have to dash away, or if you're aware of any colleagues who wish they could have come but haven't been able to make it, or there are particular sections of the um, presentation that you think will be very, very pertinent for perhaps your management team, um, feel free to direct them to our website. The conference will be um, um, uploaded there. Last, sort of next, I want to talk a little bit about the participation. We really do welcome people to participate in the chat. Please do introduce yourself if you haven't done so already. Please do add in any questions that you would like to ask of our speakers. There will be a panel at the end of this morning. Um, it might be that you just want to air your grievances, have a little bit of a rant, share some things that are working well for you in school, however you want to do it. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the morning, reflecting some of the themes that are coming up through the chat and collecting questions to ask the panel at the end. And then finally, we'd also ask that you please do use social media, Twitter particularly. There's our hashtag and our tag. If you could please use those um, to mention that you've either been to the conference or to reflect on bits that you found most interesting, we would really appreciate it. So next, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is our very own John Ambrose from Complete Careers. John is the CEO and, and my boss, and he's going to be talking to you this morning about overcoming some of the challenges of being uh, a careers leader. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to John. That's brilliant, Jenny. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to start, I'm afraid, with the... Uh, with a check to make sure that you can see the, the slides and, and hear me okay. But uh, if I don't hear anything more, I'll assume that we're okay and we'll get going. And, and also I'll start with an apology for unmuting and then deciding to clear my throat. So if, if you all heard that, uh, big apologies for that. Um, yeah, so I'm John Ambrose, Director of Complete Careers. And my session this morning is going to be a bit more of a, a set the scene. So looking at, you know, the at what cost aspect of... Uh, of the outstanding careers provision. And obviously here, I'll be looking a little bit more towards the, the financial costs, but most of it is gonna be um, arrived at more of a supportive element to make sure that as career leaders and career practitioners, that we're aware of the costs and, and the strains that are placed upon us to be able to do an outstanding careers provision. So the, the session itself, I'll, I'll be talking for about 25 minutes before handing over to, to Ed, our, our, our first keynote. Um, and what I'll be doing in that time is going to be starting to introduce this conference theme. I'll summarise a bit more about the current expectations from, from Department for Education and Ofsted. I'll also introduce some of their, their latest kind of uh, uh, reports in, in the last couple of weeks or so as part of that. Then focus a bit more on the, the, the evidence from the financial costs uh, for schools on, and colleges on, on about how to do career services effectively. And then we'll start to introduce some of the help for careers leaders and practitioners to identify the, the limitations uh, and to identify um, and, and use the support available. So that's what's, what's going to be coming. What, what I'd say really in terms of the slides, um, you know, is is that a lot of how I've designed the slides then is hopefully to be able to include quite a lot of quotes that can help you as career leaders and career practitioners to use with your senior leadership team, um, with your um, school and college leaders, and also with your um, board of governors to be able to kind of uh, manage up. So, you know, there are quite, quite a lot of words in the slides, so, but I, I'm not gonna read them word for word. You can access this recording at any time. You can email us for the slides to be able to use the contents to be able to hopefully inform change in your organization. So, so that's the nature really of, of this particular session. So let's get started by, by introducing the context then and, and the theme for, for the conference today. So the first part I want to draw on here is from 
the 2019 report from the careers and enterprise company into careers leaders in schools. So careers leadership at that time was still quite a, a relatively new phenomenon. And, um, and, you know, at the same time, we're starting to hear sound bites like from the Times Education Supplement about the career leader role being perhaps the most interesting role in school that nobody's ever heard of before kind of thing. And I think there still is quite a, 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 um, a sense of that, really, especially within our organisation. So, um, and the report itself did a survey of 750 careers leaders, and it showed about how much, um, how significantly the role is developing, but it also highlighted a number of kind of like barriers that career leaders were facing. And most of that is going to be around lack of time, lack of resources, lack of budget, level of responsibility in their organisation to be able to make change. And also just that broader buy-in, perhaps, from teachers, how engaged they were in the process. So do have a look for that. Um, but again, it's quite quite an interesting um, telling of the times. But then more recently, too, and, and perhaps also largely more alarming, too, was the report at the end of 2022, December 22, from, um, from Careers England. So this is where, again career professionals and, and employers were, were surveyed and 23% of career professionals stated that they're either likely or extremely likely to leave the sector within the next two years. So that, that's close to one in four of the workforce, bearing in mind already that there is a national shortage of careers advisors and career guidance practitioners and career professionals. And looking at this evidence, it suggests that it's only going to get worse over the next couple of years. So we really need to pull together here. A lot of the reasons cited for, for, for this was that um, a, number, a multitude of different factors that, 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 um, that will affect most career practitioners. It's going to be about poor pay, poor progression opportunities, retirement, or kind of like stress or health related issues related to the job. And it's also suggesting there that level six and level seven career professionals then and career managers are earning on average about 27, 28,000. So there's plenty of work that we need to do in the sector, but also what I'd, I'd, I'd invite you to do there um, with this evidence then is to recognize that you are uh, a professional uh, in a service that's in demand at the moment. So I think you ought to make sure that you're aware of that and that your organisation is, is very aware of that too. Last one, of course, we've got good old Facebook and the Career Leader UK National Facebook group. And obviously that has quite an air of desperation in it every day where we can see just how many uh, careers leaders are using it to, you know, to manage that last minute kind of, task that you've been asked to do or something like that you know it beeps all the way through the night kind of thing equally about some of the extremely poor practice that's posted about there about salaries and paying conditions so i think really what we're trying to say with this conference is you know we're here and we're listening kind of thing and we're trying to help you to be able to support and navigate the, the journey as, as best as you possibly can. So it's about, you know, utilizing us and seeing if we can support you along the way. I know a lot of you are incredibly busy. So we tend to have a, a couple of hundred that join us live and uh, others that, that access the recordings later on. Um, I think we're up to 70 at the moment, but obviously it is being recorded and a lot of people do register to be able to access that recording later on that we're, we're aware of. So welcome now and welcome if you're watching this back later on. So let's get started then to, to, to help us to identify the, the expectations really from DFE at the moment from the statutory guidance. The current statutory guidance was updated in January this year. And I think what's really helpful to identify is that most of the language in the 50 plus pages is all about what schools and colleges should be doing. And that means really is where 
the advice sets out should be followed unless there's a good reason not to. On a, a, a small number of occasions, I think probably only about 10 to 15 occasions, that language is strengthened to be more like a must. So that is where the person in question is legally required to do something. OK, so that's quite a big shift. And there's also quite a lot of things in between a should and a must, like an expected to, a required to, a strongly recommends. So this is a summary of those musts. And but what I'd say more than anything is to to access the link at the bottom there, which is to one of our blogs, which has got a a, a summary table of all the expected to required to musts from the statutory guidance kind of thing. And if you email us at admin at complete-careers.com, we can also arrange to get a, a uh, an audit version of that sent out to you for free. What, what, it's, what it says in essence though, without going through each of the slides on the left-hand column is, is gonna be about, you know, publishing details on the website. The actual statutory duty is about making sure that independent careers guidance is provided to all 11 to 18 year olds. So that's what the, the, the legal duty has been since about 2011 now. And then there's some, some more technical stuff around DBS around liaison with the local authority, the send and reporting data, colleges have matrix and making sure young people are aware of the raising the participation age legislation. Everything on the right is still in the same guidance, but it's all related to the provider access legislation. This new acronym of, of PAL that was introduced and this is about making sure that we've got those access arrangements that we are, it's the Baker Clause part that was strengthened in January so that there's at least two encounters per key stage with um, education and training providers and apprenticeship providers. We're publishing a policy and that we're explaining technical routes alongside academic routes. So, yeah, you can read that more perhaps at your leisure um, by coming back to this this recording or accessing the slides. But, you know, you might find that the blog helps you to be able to download a, a summary table and obviously contacting us, you can get a, an audit version of that. What I'm more interested in this session, though, is less about, you know, um, the musts particularly and more about some of the other language that's used in the statutory guidance that might be helpful for you, to you in your organization. So first of all, on page five of the statutory guidance, it talks about, well, who is the guidance for? Yes, it states careers leaders in there, but before that, it talks about the guidance being for governing bodies, for proprietors, and for school and college leaders. So identifying that you're part of the process, but, you know, responsibility ultimately has to be passed up to people like governing bodies, proprietors, school and college leaders. So um, so that's an interesting passage in there. Equally, on page uh, 11, it talks about schools and colleges are expected to appoint a careers leader who has the skills, commitment and the backing from their senior leadership team, including protected time that enables careers leaders to carry out the role effectively. And the department urges senior leaders to back their careers team, um, especially careers leaders, and to invest in, in personal guidance on page eight. So we're starting to see a bit more about some strong language here, but way beyond the careers leader, careers coordinator, careers administrator, careers practitioner, we're talking about the leaders of the organization and the governors of the organization. Okay, we're talking about what is the governing body expected to do? The governing body should be providing career, uh, provide clear advice and guidance on which the school and college leaders can base a strategic careers plan. So yes, career leaders may well want to be um, producing or certainly contributing to a strategic careers plan, and rightly so too. But it's also to recognise that it's not necessarily all on your shoulders. And 
that governing bodies should be able to be providing a steer here and giving you some support along the way. Every school and college should have a member of the governing body who takes a strategic interest in careers. And we've got one of those that's gonna be talking to us uh, later on today. And also the governing body, this is the actual statutory duty again, but notice that it's about must make sure that independent careers guidance is provided to all, but it's the governing body must make sure that. Okay, so I think that's all really interesting and really important to reflect on. And those responsibilities are set out on page 14 of the statutory guidance. Moving on from DfE for now and on towards Ofsted. Really important to reflect that they've got more of an interest in career development. Um, they have got a specific section in the handbook for what they call CIEAG, for careers effectively. And it has information that's purely about the Baker Clause. It has uh, information about what a good grade descriptor looks like for careers. It also has this paragraph in here, 308, that outlines where careers fit within that personal development aspect of, of, of career development. And it gives an idea about the kind of things that they're interested in here. Unbiased careers advice, provider access arrangements, the world of work, the Gatsby benchmarks and published information, but all under this umbrella of assessing the quality of careers provision and how well it benefits pupils in choosing and deciding on their next steps. What's quite interesting is that, um, well, before this is, is that looking at Ofsted reports in schools, the vast majority of reports now have at least a, a line or a sentence on career development. So it's, it's really interesting to see just, just how much of a prominence careers is having in there right now. They've just commissioned and completed a thematic review on careers with 30 schools and a further 15 colleges, sick form providers and apprenticeship providers. And here is a list of some of the kind of findings from that then. So we're seeing that schools and colleges are struggling to provide time and resources, which is very much aligned to, to this theme, but are doing the best job given the circumstances. More about appropriately qualified professionals, that link uh, of that importance about close working between school leaders, careers leaders, teachers, and career specialists. So that teamed approach. Linking curriculum to careers is happening, but it's very patchy, which suggests perhaps a lot of tick boxing going on in, in that element. Collecting destination data is difficult. And it's about that parity of esteem between academic and technical with some access arrangements still quite challenging at times. Talks about parents and the role they play and work experience and employer encounters. So I'd uh, encourage you to, to look at Janet College's blog on this because she summarized the thematic review so you can access that blog to be able to find the findings, as well as some further blogs on the recommendations from, from the report. What it does also give you though, is, is a lens through Ofsted about, well, what kind of things might they be looking at if they're coming into your organization anytime soon? Okay, taking it on a level, we've got the Education Select Committee that since March 22 was convening a, a series of experts, evidence really into the careers sector about how well careers is done in schools and colleges. And that ended up with a report that was published in June of this year with a lot of recommendations, some quite obscure, some quite sensible, but it also included this one, which I thought was interesting about updating the statutory guidance for appropriate time for career leader role and that schools should be made to publish on their website how much time is given to that role. 
Unfortunately, though, in the response from the DfE um, that came out last month, you can see that that isn't going to come at any time soon, I'm afraid. If we're looking for an amount, a stipulated amount about how much career leader time that there should be in place, it won't come any time soon from the department, if ever at all. And I think that second part of the paragraph there, where conversely, it could lead to reduction in the time already dedicated to a careers, for example, where a careers leader is doing more than the proposed amount. So I think that's their get out of jail free card in that sense. What they did suggest is that new statutory guidance will be coming. So, and it mentioned that alongside where it says things like about a recommendation to do the compass assessment at least once a year. So we know we'll have some new statutory guidance. All the way through the Education Select Committee report was about the need to update a strategy for careers in this country. Now, the DfE's response fell short of that, but it did mention about a strategic action plan that's going to be published next year. So we'll have to see what, what that might look like. So we've got the must of the DfE. We've got all the aspects of the Baker Clause. We've got things, the new statutory guidance coming on board, Ofsted's remit in careers. And then we've actually got the whole role as well, the job itself, you know, which is is brilliantly described here from David Andrews' research, which is in a CEC publication, The Role of the Careers Leader, outlining close to about 30 different functions now under the headings of like leadership, management, coordination, and networking. So there's a lot to do, essentially, to be able to get this right. So we know all that then now, at least, but how much does it all cost, is the question. Just, so, John, to let you know you've got five minutes remaining. Give you a little time check there. That's lovely. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so we know that um, the, the first report is, is a really interesting one. It's on the Career Guidance Guarantee. Um, Tristan Hooley, uh, Chris Percy and Siobhan Neary, Investing Careers. It sets out six priorities, really, um, in, into investing in careers. But it suggests that £68 per person is spent indirectly and directly on careers at the moment, compared to £159 per person back in 2009. It also looks there at things like the return on investment as well. So um, an investment in careers um, leads into a, a much bigger return on investment through higher people in jobs, increased salaries, and more tax to the government. The other report is around the um, Education Select Committee highlighting the 2014 um, Gatsby um, kind of report where Price Waterhouse Coopers reported that it's 173 to 207 million each year to adequately resource career development in schools and colleges. So 38 to 76 per school depending on size and location. It also shows that 30 million is dedicated to careers at the moment, and that goes through support through the, the careers and enterprise company. No funding goes directly to schools for career development. So if you're finding it really difficult and challenging to do what you're asked to do, I think that's largely because it's grossly inadequately funded from, from a central perspective. So we need to ask ourselves the questions about, well, what are our limitations? What are the priorities and what support is available? So as you progress through the conference this morning, what I'd like to ask you, what I'd like you to do is to ask yourself, well, so how much is actually too much about what's expected of me? When is enough actually enough? And something has to give, but, but what, what is that going to be? So review and reflect on that. Some of the questions you might already have had answered in, 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 in some degree. Others, a lot of the speakers will help you to be able to mull those over. My advice to you would be to be able to make sure you do look after yourselves and you do make priorities. Obviously, the must table, so do look out for that, will help you to be able to look at the legal aspects there. 
But beyond that, try and kind of look at things through the lenses about asking yourself, does what I'm doing help my learners to develop their career knowledge, skills and attitudes, their overall career management competencies to enable them to make successful transitions? And if the answer is no to that question, then I think you perhaps need to seriously ask yourself, well, why am I being asked to do this? So that, that might help in some ways. We've got a fantastic range of speakers ahead of you this morning. Ed's gonna help us off in a moment to really look at our well-being as career practitioners, because if we haven't got that right, it's gonna be very difficult to be able to lead, manage and support our learners. We've got Ellis from the Prior Education Federation of Academies Trust, looking at sharing the role across the academy. Tom Corrie, Career Leader of the Year from Chertsey High School, no career leader is an island, making sure that we're focusing on, you know, managing and spreading the workload, managing up, but also getting that buy in that we talked about before. And again, our very own Janet Hutchinson from Complete Careers, looking at the quality and careers standard. Often it's seen as a bit of a stick, as something else to do, but it's also very much as a carrot as well, where Nobody else apart from yourself will know your careers program as well as your quality and career standard assessor. It's about utilizing the process to help influence change in your organization that might be more challenging for you to do on your own. So that's my session. I'm really grateful for everyone for listening this morning. I'll be around for the whole, whole conference and we'll have a Q&A session later on. But the last thing to say is, is Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your morning. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks very much, John. And it's really interesting to hear, you know, and, and really break down that guidance to say that actually there is a suggestion that we can't do it all on our own. Careers leaders cannot possibly manage um, everything that's expected of them on their own. But that relationship and those conversations with, with different people and different stakeholders to kind of spread that responsibility can be a challenge. Well, our next speaker this morning is Edward Tollenby, and Ed is going to talk to us a little bit about managing career practitioner well-being. So as John has touched on, we speak to careers leaders across the country all the time, and we know that something sometimes has got to give, that it's putting a great deal of strain on you uh, professionally and personally. So we're hoping in Ed's session today, you can get a little bit of an insight into how to make sure you care for yourself, because having a healthy you in post is the best way to maintain a, a good careers provision for those learners. So I will hand over to Ed now and he will be talking to you. Um, and I'll give you a two minute warning if that's okay, Ed, when you're coming towards the end of your session. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks ever so much. That's wonderful. What a great introduction, my goodness me. Um, it's wonderful uh, to have an opportunity to so spend some time with you. And I'm hoping that we achieve two things, just two things in our time together today. The first thing is, I'm hoping you enjoy it. I think at the beginning of what promises to be a fantastic day, it's nice if we enjoy it, we have a little bit of a giggle together. And obviously, if we were in a room, it's a little bit easier sometimes. But even on Zoom, I'm hoping that we have a little bit of a chuckle and that the time flies by having enjoyed our time together. But I recognise how precious your time is, so I don't want to waste it. So if in the next 45 minutes I can share with you maybe some hints, tips and suggestions that I can hand on heart say have had a big impact on me, uh, my family, um, but also now tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people in similar roles and responsibilities to you from all over the country, from hundreds of different schools that I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with, uh, not just in terms of speaking at conferences and twilight sessions and sort of uh, inset days, but also some of the coaching that I'm involved in with people, again, from a wide range of different roles and responsibilities, but also um, and including quite a number of careers pro professionals. And so I want to share with you some things that just very down to earth, very practical, that may go some way to saying, look, how do we get the best out of ourselves and how do we get the best out of others? So just a couple of practical things. Uh, rather than using slides, um, I'm going to make some slides and some resources available after the session. I've got a few kind of prompts and visual aids just to bring it to life a little bit. 
Um, but depending on uh, whether you're on a phone, whether you're on a tablet or whether you're on um, a laptop or desktop or something like that, you may be very familiar with Zoom. But I would just recommend if you haven't already done so, just to change your view to being the uh, speaker, just so as um, you kind of get me. Sorry, I'm not more attractive, but just so as you get me nice and large on the screen, just so as you can see some of the things um, that I'll be showing um, and holding up. So if you're able to do that, then fantastic. But I would love it if this session was as participative as possible. That's not an easy phrase to say at this time of the morning, but as participative as possible. So I know that everyone's got their cameras off, which is great. It kind of helps uh, just make Wi-Fi and everything a little bit more stable for people um, and just means that there isn't too many distractions. But what I would love to think is that um, you'll use the chat just to contribute, to answer some questions or perhaps even to ask some questions and as John has already said we'll try and capture those as best as we can I know there's a QA and a a little bit later on which I'll be involved in but over and above that if there are things that I share that make you curious or raise some questions and you want a bit more information over and above the stuff that I make available at the end of our time together by all means do get in touch so whilst I can't wave magic wands I want this time to be as valuable as it possibly can be so I'll try and keep a bit of an eye on uh, the chat I'll try and uh, share some things that I think could be of benefit to you um, and we'll make it as participative as possible so much so that if I ask you to do a little activity I'm going to just trust that you're going to do it. So you don't have to take notes. You don't have to kind of jot things down. But if you have got a pen and paper, you might find it helpful. But that doesn't mean to say you can't be involved um, if you haven't got a pen and paper. And there's people milling around and about and you feel a bit daft if I ask you to do things um, in a little while. So with all of that said, let me just start by saying that when you... Um, kind of hear some of those statistics. When you read the reports in 2019 and even in 2022, those CEC reports and the Careers England reports, you begin to get a feel for the stress and the strain that people are under. I know in my own life and the different things that I've been involved in, when I'm trying to raise aspirations, when I'm looking at work experience programs, when I'm looking at the health and safety of those uh, work experience programs, when I'm trying to get people to make choices um, each day that brings uh, the likelihood of them achieving, not just in terms of attainment, but also those aspirations that they've got, it does come at a cost. So it's interesting that we're looking at this sort of how do we manage the cost, because there is a cost to all of us. And having spent a lot of time with a lot of people and reflected on my own life, I recognise that pretty much everyone on this call today, if we're honest, are under a fair amount of stress and strain. So with 74 or so people, including me, here on the call today, based on statistics alone, in your professional lives and your personal lives, it's fair to say you've got a lot going on at the moment. You've got a lot on your plate. You're under a lot of stress and strain when you haven't got the budgets, as we know, when you're being asked to do a huge amount in a relatively short period of time, that does come at a cost and puts us under stress and strain. Now, this is not a trick question. And I'm hoping that people will indulge me just by putting the answer into the chat, if you would. But if I continue to put this under stress and strain, what's going to happen to it? So just very quickly, there's no prize for who is the speediest on the keyboard or the typewriter or something like that. But we've got uh, Michaela, we've got uh, Natalie, we've got uh, Jenny. There's loads of people. Thank you. It is lovely when you get a little bit of interaction, a little bit of feedback. So thank you very much for doing that. You're quite right. It's going to snap or it's going to break. And so many people kind of either get to a place whereby they're concerned about something going snap or something breaking, or they've already reached that point. And when you see that maybe a quarter of your colleagues are considering leaving the profession, you begin to recognize there is a cost to this. There is some level of stress and strain that's going on. So whilst I can't wave magic wands, maybe what I can do is say, look, here are some techniques, some approaches that will go some way to helping you cope with the stress and strain. But one of the key things is to say, look, how do we build in recovery? How do we begin to recognize that self-care isn't selfish? 
And so many people, including myself, were just going and going and going and going. And it was almost like I was trying to give out from an empty cup. And it wasn't so much that my physical, my emotional or my mental health was struggling. It was actually my relationships. So being very honest with you, what I find is that sometimes when I'm going out and I'm going to be there for everybody else, what sometimes happens is that everyone else gets the best of me, but people at home get the rest of me. Just going to let that sink in for a moment, because I think even though I can't see your faces, there'll be some of you just going, yep, <laughs> absolutely. Because sometimes it's so true, isn't it, that we kind of give out to everybody else and they get the best of us. But people at home get the rest of us because we've got no words left. We've got no decisions left. And it's like sometimes we can feel so guilty about doing that. And so I recognize with my wife involved in education, the stuff that we're both involved in, in terms of education, we've got the matrix standard, we're Ofsted inspected. So again, I have an understanding and a sensitivity to that. It was almost like, actually, how do we manage to continue to do our utmost for everybody else, but also how do we be there for one another and for our children? And my background in sports psychology and coaching and those sorts of things. Just help me realize, look, an athlete cannot train every day of the week. It moves from being helpful and healthy to their progression to unhelpful and unhealthy. And so they have to build in rest times, rest days. And it's the same for us. We have to, I believe, recognize that self-care isn't selfish. We have to recognize that if we won't do it for ourselves, we actually will be more tolerant. We will be able to think more clearly, more concisely. We will be more generous and effective in our communication if we look after ourselves. Now, um, a bit of an odd question for you, but either by indicating in the chat or the reactions, just as quick as you possibly can, just indicate to me if you've ever been fortunate enough to fly. OK, so use the reactions, put a hand up, a thumbs up, put in the chat saying whether you have been fortunate enough to fly. Thanks, Vicky. Fantastic. OK, and just to be clear, I do mean on a plane as opposed to on drugs. OK, if you're going, my nuts, what's that got to do with anything? Okay. <laughs> That's a whole different session that we're not going to touch on today. But instead, joking aside, if you've been fortunate enough to fly on a plane, no doubt when they say, can we have your attention? You'd have put down the duty free and you'd have listened to them talk about the exits being here, here and here. Yeah, sound familiar. But they then go on to say something that I find interesting. And it's along the lines of if there's a sudden drop in pressure, something is going to drop from above. Now, what is it that drops from above? It's the oxygen mask. And again, what is it of interest to me and perhaps to in of interest to you? Two is that they then go on to say, look, before you look after everybody else, before you try and help others, look after yourself first. Put your own oxygen mask on first before you look after other people. And for me, what I interpret that in terms of my own life is a case of saying, look, I recognize that the people involved in aviation know what they're talking about. They know that categorically you are more able to look after everybody else if you put your own oxygen mask on. And so it can be counterintuitive sometimes. But I've met so many people that can't, don't or won't put their own oxygen mask on for a number of different reasons. And so it's a case of saying, look, if self-care feels selfish, if it feels like an indulgence, maybe we need to learn to flip our thinking. And say, look, reality rules. This is coming at a cost. I'm not trying to kind of make out that I've got it harder than other people. But the reality is there's a lot of stress and strain going on. And in order for me to maintain that and be able to give out to other people, I've got to find a way to put my own oxygen mask on. And it's lovely that, again, people are kind of interacting on the chat and those sorts of things. But for me, I have to be disciplined to do that because my natural place is I just go and go and go, try and be there for everybody else. And at times, there are certain things that 
help me recognize the stress and strain that I'm under is when my tolerance levels are reduced. That's normally a sign that I'm giving out a bit too much. When I get a bit more grumpy, when I get a bit snippy, when I find myself kind of get a bit resentful, perhaps of colleagues, of friends, of family, that's typically a sign to me and an indication that I've got to find better ways to cope and manage, but also to build in that recovery time without seeing it as an indulgence, but seeing it as an event, uh, as an investment. Now, again, with all of the information that I um, share with you today, I'll, I'll give some resources, I'll give some suggestions and some kind of slides and bits and pieces um, that you can have a look at. But one of the books that I would highly recommend people consider looking at or indeed reading or at least following the author, a guy called Alex Sujong Kim Pang, wrote an incredible book. It's great, Helen, that you've uh, read it yourself. Now, I might not do it justice, but in all of his book, basically what he's saying is, according to pretty much every piece of research, and I would be inclined to agree, having been fascinated with human behavior and those sorts of things for, what, 20, 30 years, according to Alex and most other professionals, they will say, that actually you are at your best when you rest. You are, as I mentioned beforehand, more able to problem solve, fact. You are more able to be effective in your communication, generous in your communication, fact. You're more able to be creative. And so all of those things are aiding us to be the best versions of ourselves, not just in a professional context, context but also maybe in a in our personal lives as well and so I'm hoping that as we spend a bit more time unpacking about how do we do this that it begins to resonate with you that your takeaway from our whole time our whole sort of time up until one o'clock but just our kind of half an hour or so that we've got left of my session that some of the takeaways is so what am I going to change because here's the harsh truth if nothing changes, nothing changes. We have to find ways to make improvements and enhancements and begin to build in some of those daily disciplines that aid us throughout our day. So let me just give you a couple of suggestions, a couple of ideas, a couple of uh, approaches. And rather than using slides, and I hope it doesn't feel too self-indulgent that I want everyone just looking at me, um, it's because it's my new shirt. It's because John had a nice shirt on. I thought, you know what? I've obviously chosen well. But I just thought rather than having the slides, I'll make those available afterwards. But I want it, again, just to be kind of a bit um, more interactive and maybe just kind of give you an opportunity just to jot some things down if you want to, just so as it becomes a bit easier to remember. And everything that I share with you is going to be dead easy for you to remember. OK, so if you have got a pen and paper, we'll use those in a moment or two. But let me just put this into context by doing um, something that you might feel a little bit awkward doing. And I'm really hoping that although I can't see you, Wherever you are, I'm hoping you're going to go along with this. OK, so what I'd like to invite you to do, if you would, please, is just put your hands in front of you like this. OK, don't drop your phone, don't, don't drop anything, a cup of tea or whatever, but just put your hands in front of you. And then if you would, would you bring your hands together and interlock your fingers? OK, now with what, 73 or so of us on the call, there will be a handful of you that will have your thumbs side by side. But a higher proportion of us will either have their right thumb or their left thumb on the top. OK, now you can take your hands apart because I want you just very, very quickly in the chat. Just tell me whether it was your right thumb or your left thumb that was on the top. OK, goodness me, you are super speedy on the keyboards. OK, excellent stuff. So quite a number of you are right thumb, Helen's right thumb. Uh, Jenny, Katie's left. Okay, fantastic. Hannah is left as well. Okay. Now then, what I'd like you to do now is if your right thumb was on the top, I'm going to ask you to put your left thumb on the top. And if your left thumb was on the top last time, I'd like you to put your right thumb on the top. Do the opposite. Now I've got visions <laughs> of all of you going, 
that feels really weird. But a number of people are kind of putting in the chat going, that's not easy. It feels really strange, doesn't it? It feels awkward and uncomfortable. Likewise, would you mind just folding your arms for me, please? Excellent. I've got visions of you all sat there, kind of with your arms folded. Now just fold your arms the other way. <laughs> I'm laughing because I guarantee that there will be people going, what, what do you mean fold your arms the other way? Because it feels, again, really, really difficult. I know Joe's kind of going, I can't do that. I actually can't do it. You see, here's my point. And there's a point to all the random things that we might do during our time together today. My point is this. You have been putting your hands together and you have been folding your arms the same way for years and years and years without even thinking about it. Is that true? Of course it is. At some point when you were younger, you put your hands together or you folded your arms and pretty much every day since, that's just how you do it. And so in psychology, and you've probably come across this yourselves, they talk about being on autopilot. Okay. So you must have had times, have you not, where you go from point A to point B and you don't remember the journey. Yeah. For some of you, if I was to chat with you and say, so how long you've been in a career as professional? How long you've been doing this kind of work? You might go, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it's like three years or 15 years or whatever, because time has a habit of just flying by. And to some extent, it's because we're on autopilot. And they estimate that 50 to 55 percent, maybe even as much as 80 to 85 percent of everybody's day is just doing what you've always done, just kind of going through the motions of life. Now, that's not to be critical. It's just saying to a large extent, that is how we cope. We just kind of go into autopilot. We just do the things that we've become competent at and are confident at. But I genuinely believe that the same can be said about how we view self-care. We have learned these habits in the way that we look after ourselves or indeed don't look after ourselves. Certain views, certain kind of values that we've placed that through no fault of our own could mean that we're there for everybody else, putting everybody else's oxygen mask on. And again, we can't, we don't, or we won't put our own oxygen mask on. And for me, and perhaps for some of you on the call today, it's just a case of going, this feels awkward and uncomfortable. This is certainly not my normal, natural way of doing things. But can I begin to build in some things that I know, according to all of the research, are going to help me in all of the areas of my life? So again, because I want it to be nice and easy to remember, I want you to either think about or jot down the word self. So if we're talking about self-care, I've kind of taken the letters of self, S-E-L-F, I had to think then, S-E-L-F, and just a couple of things that I want to talk about that you may say, but Ed, you don't understand. I've got this going on, I've got that going on. So I'm not trying to be critical, I'm not trying to be patronising, I'm just kind of come across, hopefully coming across as a I don't know, maybe out of kindness, not criticism. And so when I talk about self, I will often say it's really important to be attentive to the S, sleep. So each of those letters are going to stand for a different word. The first one being sleep. Now, I'm curious. In the chat, would you mind telling me how many hours on average, because I know it changes a little bit, on average, how many hours of sleep? might you get each night? So some people about six or seven, some people say four or five. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. So six to seven, eight, some people as low as four, people saying less than four. Now, according to most research, they will say that typically people need about eight hours sleep. Now it does vary slightly, but I cannot remember the last time I got eight hours sleep. I don't know what I'll do with myself. <laughs> For lots of different reasons, I struggle to sleep. I struggle to switch off what's going on in here because I'm thinking, actually, I need to do that. I need to get that done at work and at home. But what I'm learning is that maybe I can begin to build in diff different routines in order to help me sleep a little bit better. Now, it's not just sleep 
that kind of tops up our tank. So what I mean by topping up our tank is that people like Kathy Madhavan and lots of other people that are involved in sort of personal development type work, they will say we all have our tank of reserves, our cognitive function, our, our emotional resilience, but also our physical wherewithal to be able to cope with all that life throws at us. And what Kathy and other people talk about is that sleep will obviously top your tank up. And so if your tank that was full would be an eight, nine or 10, hopefully if you're kind of running on empty during the days and your tank is getting depleted, maybe kind of getting a decent night's sleep will top your tank up. But for some people, when they can't sleep well, for lots of different reasons, they might need to find other ways to top up their tank. So sleep is certainly one of them. The second one is exercise. Now, again, everybody knows the benefits of exercise. From very young people to older people, we all know it does us good. But when we're going and going and going, we just think, I'm too tired, I'm drained, I, I've got aches and pains. I just, I, I can't do it for a number of reasons, including can't be bothered. But here's the challenge. The way that complacency works, i.e. I can't be bothered, the more you can't be bothered, guess what? The more you can't be bothered. So sometimes we need to break that cycle by saying, okay, I need to be attentive to my sleep. So for me, one little thing is I used to watch the 10 o'clock news and wonder why I can't sleep. It's because one of the last things that I see is how horrible the world is. So I go to bed thinking the world is a horrible place and can't switch this off. So I want to be aware of the news and what's going on, but maybe my digital diet and what I've consumed digitally, whether it's the news, whether it's social media, maybe I do have a choice around some of those things and what I'm consuming. So I will watch the news during the day when I can process it. And that, for example, is one of the things that I might do around sleep. But likewise, with my exercise, kind of hard to do that when you're traveling, going to service stations, hotels and stuff like that. But instead of focusing on what I can't do around my exercise, maybe it's a case of flipping my thinking and going, yeah, but what can I do? It doesn't have to be onerous, but maybe I could get out a little bit more for walks and all of those sorts of things. So sleep and exercise are hugely important. Now, the next one kind of makes me smile. <clears throat> It makes me smile because it reminds me of a conversation that I had with a lady who must have been in her, her mid 70s. It was a session that I ran with NHS England and we got to the tea break and she came up to me and she put her hands over mine and she said, my dear, I love what you've been talking about. I really like this idea of the oxygen mask. And she said, and I like the idea of self. And she said, I need to make sure I try and sleep a bit better. And I probably ought to exercise a little bit more. But the L stands for love. And what I said in that conference and what I'm going to share with you is be around people and places you love. Be around people and places that you love. And she made me smile because she said, when you said that, Ed, I realized it needs to be a place that I love. She said, my dear. I've been married probably longer than you've been alive. I can't even remember liking him, let alone loving him. So the last person that I <laughs> that I want to spend time with is my husband. So she made me chuckle, but she said, but I've realized, actually, I love being around water. She said, when I had a dog, we used to go out and we would walk and there was like a little stream and I used to love hearing the stream. And now that we no longer have a dog, I don't go out for a walk. I don't go back to that very place that I know is like my oxygen mask because being around water restores me. It replenishes me. It kind of gives me rest. So she said, my takeaway, Ed, is I'm going to start walking again because it will give me exercise. Um, it will hopefully tire me out so I I sleep, but also it's a place that I love. So I just want to encourage you, be around people. And there are some people that will build you up, but there'll also be some mood hoovers <laughs> that suck the energy from you and from a room. And it's like, it's, all the energy is gone. Now, just sometimes put some boundaries around that. 
Okay, so drains rather than radiators. I love how you put that in. Thank you, Vicky. So if sleep and then exercise and love are the first three letters of self, F stands for fun. Because one of the things, food is a good one. I do love my food, I must admit, but it's actually fun, okay? So one of the ways that I know that I'm kind of under a bit too much stress and strain and I haven't necessarily used some of the tools and techniques, including building in that recovery time, is my tolerance levels are lower and I no longer find things as funny. So my children in the holidays could behave in a certain way. And because it's the holidays, I'm a bit more rested, a bit more relaxed. I find it funny and I might even join in. But in a, if in a few weeks time, when we've been back into this kind of academic year and we're kind of going at it, I kind of find that same behavior, if I'm really honest with you, annoying because my tolerance levels are lower. Sometimes some of the uh, young people that I spend time with at the beginning of the year, I know that I might be a bit more generous in my speech, be prepared to go over and above and, and listen a bit more attentively. But again, being completely honest with you, as the days, weeks and months go by, I do sometimes find it harder to listen, sometimes harder to be generous and compassionate in some of my um, approaches. And so if I can find the funny, if every day, literally every day, I can make sure that I giggle and I laugh with my family and with friends, then that's going to help. Now, in the chat, I would love it if you would just spend a moment or two and think about what you have done previously or what you are doing now, or perhaps what you might do in the future around sleep, around exercise, around being around people and places that you love, or what do you find that's fun? Now, keep it professional, keep it clean, but I'd just love to know who do you find funny? What music do you enjoy? Can you go to concerts? What could you do to top up your tank, given the fact that all of the reports, anyone you talk to with a similar role is going, yeah, kind of comes at a cost. There's a lot going on. So I'm going to have a little look at the chat. So forgive me if my eyes kind of wander as I kind of bring this up, because I want to have a little bit of a look. Fantastic. So 80s music, work part time. Okay. Uh, so watching 10 o'clock news. <laughs> Love a bit of yoga. Fantastic. Good. So spending time with animals, getting out in the countryside. Good. Now, I can't set homework. <laughs> I can't kind of insist on anything. But what I would love to think is that I would encourage you in some way to say maybe some of the takeaways. Why? Because life rewards action, not intention. Life rewards action, not intention. And so for me, I've got very good intentions, but I don't always take steps. I don't always recognize that I do need to do some of these things. And I need to get it in my diary because if it's in my diary, there's a good chance it's going to happen. Now, again, I'm throwing lots at you, but hopefully it's nice and easy to remember. But likewise, what I want to share with you is a quote by a guy called Michael Josephson. So Michael Josephson said a number of different things, but I love his phrase that basically says, we don't have to be sick to get better. We don't have to be sick to get better. And I know for me, my tendency is to wait for something to go pop, to snap, for me to lose my temper or for me to kind of feel really drained or unwell and those sorts of things. And so I sometimes wait too long instead of going, but I don't have to be sick to get better. What I need to do is to recognize every day my tank of reserves is kind of getting drained. So in a proactive way, can I begin to do some of these things that allows me just to continually try and top it up rather than deplete it? Now, again, indulge me if you would. Here and now, without playing a comparison game and saying, well, I've got it harder than you, you've got it harder than me. But I just want to get a feel, if I may, for kind of how you're doing at the moment. So if this tank of reserves, your cognitive function, your emotional resilience, but also your physical wherewithal was kind of pretty high and your 
tank was topped up, you'd be scoring an eight, nine or 10, 10 out of 10 being top. But if you're saying I'm on this call today and it's pretty depleted, you would score maybe a, a zero, one, two or three. So I just kind of want to get a feel, if I may, for kind of who on the call is scoring themselves below five, above five. Thank you. Just give you a moment to, to do that. Okay. So there's a bit of a range, but I'm hoping that wherever your score, it, score is, it's a case of saying, okay, I don't have to be sick to get better. I need to begin to put some of these things in place in order to be at my best. Now, um, I have a little magnifying glass as well as my red elastic band because I think we can learn something from a magnifying glass. And I always have one of these in my office. And it's a reminder to me that what I focus on magnifies. What I focus on magnifies. So if I'm focusing on all of the things that I didn't get done that day, all of the things that I really had hoped <laughs> to be able to achieve but didn't, for whatever reason, if I focus on what I can't do, what I haven't done, on the things that I consider to be my faults, my flaws and my failings, guess what? They're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in my life. Now, it's not that I want to be delusional, but there is a place, I believe, in terms of maintaining a healthy kind of uh, lifestyle. And when we're looking at our well-being, sometimes we have to shift our focus. Sometimes we have to shift our focus from the things that have gone well, even just the smallest thing, just some glimmer of hope in a child or with a colleague when somebody gets it, rather than all of the conversations that you think, <laughs> is it just me? Am I talking to a brick wall? How is it that I can keep saying the same thing over and over and over again? People are not buying into this. We're not getting the investment. We're not getting the time. I'm not getting the resources. I found that that will deplete me and drain me. I want to be attentive to some of those things. But there's a little phrase that we've found to be really helpful in our family and in the organizations I'm involved in, including the businesses and the charities and those sorts of things. And it's along the lines of what we focus on magnifies. But we use this phrase of find the sparks in the dark. Find the sparks in the dark. And if you're jotting that down, I'll give you a moment or two to do that. Because there's a lot of stuff that if we focus on can make us kind of feel a bit rubbish, can deplete us uh, of our reserves and those sorts of things. But we might have to look quite hard. But I do genuinely believe that we can find some sparks in the dark, some positive things. And when we as an individual, when our families, when our colleagues, when our school environment begins to recognize, yeah, but what's working well? What's our green zone, our, our green zone, as we call it, that, that we can do something about, that we can begin to change, that we can be proud of, rather than some of the things that we might be putting a lot of emotional investment in, a lot of headspace in that maybe we can't control. Maybe we can't even influence it. So reluctantly, we sometimes have to accept that that's not a battle that we want to fight because we're better putting our energies into some of the other things. And when we top up our tank, including finding the sparks in the dark and what we focus on magnifies, we get to a place, I believe, where we can begin to say, OK, this feels a little bit more manageable. Reality rules, it's still coming at a cost, but I have some tools and techniques around my self-care that help me to be able to cope with it, including building in that, that kind of, I don't know, self-care, oxygen mask, however you want to approach it. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something that, again, is going to make you feel a little bit silly, okay? So before we finish up, which we'll do in about five or six minutes, there or thereabouts, I just want to ask you to do something. And I'd like you, if you would, just to make a fist with one hand. Now, again, I can't see any of you, but I'm just hoping and trusting that you're willing to go along with this. So if you've made a fist with one hand, could you put the other hand over the top for me, please? OK, now, 
If you understand anatomy and physiology, bear with me, because I'm going to suggest that this is a little bit like our brains. OK, so if this was our brain, this top bit here, you don't necessarily have to wiggle your fingers. OK, <laughs> but this top bit here, this would be our rational brain. It's the bit that deals with language, logic, reason, problem solving. OK, this if it was the brain, would be in basic terms where our emotions come from. And down here, the knuckle of the wrist, that is our primitive brain. So the old brain. So people like uh, Steve Peters talks about chimp paradox and how we have this kind of old brain that he refers to as a chimp. You might have come across that. We then got our emotions. And then in basic terms, we started getting clever and developed our higher brain. Now, I'm about to make a noise and carry out an action. And so I don't feel too silly. And again, I'm not going to see or hear you, but I would love to think that some of you might indulge me and do this as well. Wherever you are, do the same noise and carry out the same action. Again, I've got visions of you all kind of doing this and some of your colleagues looking across going, what on earth are you doing? But there is a point to it because most people do not realise that you and I are physiologically designed in such a way that this clever, logical, rational part of the brain is designed to shut down at certain times, which is why very smart people sometimes do very daft things. I've heard it put this way. I don't particularly like the phrase, but I think it kind of resonates with people that stress makes us stupid. Sound familiar? And the reason why... It's because when our emotions are heightened, when we are feeling stressed, when we are feeling anxious, when we're kind of getting apprehensive about certain things, whatever those emotions are, when they are massively increased, what happens is that our ability to think straight, think rationally, reasonably, to use language in an effective, kind and generous way, that is massively depleted. And so... When I say that most research, including kind of the book uh, Rest here, when you look at some of the work by a guy called Paul McGee or Professor Paul McGee in his book, How Not to Worry, when you look at other material from Paul McGee, who I work very closely with, I would highly recommend How Not to Worry. Self-Confidence is a brilliant book. But also, and I'm fortunate that I get to kind of work with Paul and have done for the last 10 or 11 years, unpacking some of the material in his book, Sumo. And Sumo is not meant to be offensive because you might see that it stands for shut up and move on. You might see that actually what he's saying is just shut up and move on. Get over it. There's people with harder jobs than you. There's people with harder lives than you. That's not what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying today. It's more a case of going... Can we learn to shut up some of the negative thoughts and some of the negative feelings? And can we move on to thinking and feeling and acting in a way that works for us rather than against us? Can we see self-care as an investment, not an indulgence? And one of the ways that he, I, and lots of other people begin to uh, kind of do that as a daily habit is not just that kind of self model, not just kind of find the sparks in the dark and what you focus on magnifies, but it's to cultivate, and I use that word deliberate, deliberately, to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. So I just want very, very quickly, if you would, to think of four things that here and now, today, you're grateful or you're thankful for. So it's the thankful for, four things of things that you're grateful for, because your attitude of gratitude will make a big difference to your mental health, your well-being, and those sorts of things, because it helps you find the sparks in the dark. It will release chemicals that make you feel better, and it allows you to continue to cope and manage with some of those things. So just in the chat, if you would, and if you haven't got time to do that or you prefer just to jot them down, I'm going to give you literally 30 seconds to pop in kind of what are some of the things that you're grateful for here and now today. Thanks, Alexandra. Great. Thanks, Emma. 
Thanks, Helen. Helen, you've been well on it with all of the typing. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tracy. Good stuff. Thanks, Sophie. I really appreciate your involvement, participating. Tom, I'm with you. Cold beer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff. Good creativity. Animals, dogs are featuring quite highly, getting out um, in Lincolnshire, where I'm based. And it's good to see people from Boston and Spalding, Haven High, and some of the others that I'm aware of. So it's great to see some of those um, and people from further afield as well. So whether you're going to walk around in rural Lincolnshire, whether you're going to find a park or something like that, I just want you to be attentive and spend a little bit of time recognising if we can cultivate an attitude of gratitude, it makes a big difference. And as I begin to draw to a close, one final thing that I'm going to ask you to try and put into the chat, if you would. Not all of you will be able to do this, and it might show your age if you're able to answer this. Now, it doesn't really do it justice on a screen, but how many of you know what this is? Just pop in the chat if you know what this little thing here is. Yeah, there we go. Fantastic. Now, this is a weeble. And again, if you are familiar with weebles, you will know that in the 70s and 80s, this was the toy to have. You could even get little helter-skelters and those sorts of things. And somebody has quite rightly put it in there. Thanks, Joe. The advert said, weebles wobble, but we don't fall down. My hope is that in some small way, in kind of the time that I've had with you, which is nearly through, I've shared with you just some ideas, some hints, tips and suggestions that go some way to recognising, look, you're going to have things that make you wobble through no fault of your own oftentimes. All of the stuff that kind of you have to cope with, you have to manage in your demanding roles and responsibilities. But maybe if we can begin to build in this attitude of gratitude, this view that self-care isn't selfish, we begin to wobble, but we're not going to fall down. So with that in mind, I'll hand you back to Jenny. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to spend some time with you. Thank you so much, Ed. And that was just wonderful because I think we talk so much about the stress and the strain that, that careers professionals are under, but we don't often get an insight into kind of some practical strategies to actually help us with that. I and mean, it was, we were talking in the office just now, it was World Mental Health Day yesterday. And we passed that message on so strongly to our learners that they need to kind of improve, you know, look to think about their work-life balance that's in the CDI framework but we're not really thinking often about it for ourselves and as careers practitioners as well we need to model we need to model good behavior you know the, the people sitting opposite us particularly when we're delivering guidance um are looking to us for support and in that we need to be modeling it as well so thank you so much Ed it was really really helpful if you've got any questions for Ed please put them in chat I've I've got a few comments that I think can definitely be extended into conversation pieces when the panel is on but if there's any questions you'd like to ask Ed put them in there now we've now got a 15 minute break for a cup of tea and for perhaps a bit of meditation or anything you feel stroking your pet if you're lucky enough to be working from home things that are going to make you feel good in the next 15 minutes before our next speaker so thanks very much for for, for being with us um, this far and we'll see you at 11 o'clock Hello, I hope you've all managed to get yourself a cup of tea or coffee and a bit of a rest and kind of release that elastic band a little bit, perhaps. And I hope you really enjoyed Ed's talk. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from Ellis Potter um, from the Priory Federation um, of Academies. And he's going to be talking to you a little bit about sharing that responsibility. And he has a very good understanding of, of how that, that can be done so that the pressure isn't being put on, on one individual. So over to you, Ellis. And if you're happy to share your slides, I'll give you a, a two minute warning if that's all right when you're running out of time. Thank you, Jenny, and I will try and fully buster my way through as I try and share my screen. Um, here we go. So that is trying to share. I'm just going to the slides. But yeah, if you can let me know that that is coming up when it's on. Is that now showing? It took a while. Is it showing up on your screen? Yeah, is it? Yeah. 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 yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much for having us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's always a pleasure, pleasure to speak at these conferences. Um, I, I always make the joke, I think it happens every time, that I always feel like I'm following 
the you know such a fantastic speaker but i think that's testament to the profession and the people that we're drawing into these conferences because uh, every single time you know it, it, there's always so much stuff that we get from from these conferences so, so thank you again for doing that um what what i want to do today i suppose um is is, is really just talk about what what we're doing as a trust um so who we are with the Pride Federation of Academies Trust. We are a multi-academy trust of 12, soon to be 13 schools, predominantly based in Lincolnshire. We do have um, one of our secondaries in Leicestershire. Um, and, and the trust covers all, all phases of education. So we have primary, we have secondary, we have all through, um, and we also have a special school. And we also run apprenticeships and the Lincolnshire skits so we we have almost an, an all-age service particularly when it comes to to offering career support and, and careers advice and guidance I suppose that the purpose today was in keeping with the conference theme was to, to hopefully try and demonstrate and hopefully give some ideas sow some seeds about what staff mod, staffing models could look like in in careers and certainly the staffing models that that we've tried to implement here at the trust in response to the understanding that the careers world is diverse, it's complex, that the roles that we do are are complicated. We have a lot of priorities, a lot of strands to the work that we're doing and how we've, how we've modelled that to help share that load on our careers teams, ultimately on the ground working with our students. Um, I suppose what, what I would put on, on this is a little bit of a health warning, I suppose, that, that as a trust, we, we've we invested very heavily in careers. And the rationale being that that we really accept the importance of careers for, for our trust, for our students, but also the wider area because of the impact that it has. And, and the trust really understands how complex it is, both strategically and operationally, to, to get it right. But ultimately, the, the trust believes in the significant impact that careers can have on our young people. And for us, that's thousands of students from primary through to secondary at our special school for our apprentices. We, we believe in the impact that this has when we do it well, when we do it right. And ultimately, that's the grounding for the rationale for why we distribute this responsibility, why we've invested heavily. And I'll talk about what that investment looks like in terms of our staffing models. But ultimately, it's to make sure that all of our students have a quality and an equitable careers experience when they're with us um, across the trust. The trust vision is to improve the life chances of our pupils so that they become true citizens of the world. And ultimately, we, we can't achieve that without the investment in, in quality um, careers, education, information, advice and guidance. Uh, across all of our uh, academies. In terms of who I am, um, I joined the Trust February 2022. I joined as the Strategic Careers Lead, so I was there to, to ultimately oversee the careers provision, um, again, across all, all of our phases. Um, in September, um, my role changed slightly, so now I look after the apprenticeships team in addition to careers and play a, a role in the shaping of our post-16 work, which I will come on to. But the reason I'm telling you that is, is what we're doing in careers is, is making sure it's almost part of the fabric of the organisation that for our young people for to have those destinations, they need that quality career support. And that's further embedding the importance of the roles of our careers teams across our organisation. So where I'm going to start is, is with our careers guidance, and I'm going to move on to some of those different priorities that we have um, in, in the sector in terms of what we're expected to, to deliver um, to contribute to our quality careers programmes. Now, careers guidance for us was one of the first decisions we made in terms of making sure that our students get a high quality and equitable experience. So as a trust, we employ a team of careers advisors. So we, we internally, centrally employ careers advisors. We have three careers advisors who are all magnificent, absolutely brilliant at what they do. And they work across our six secondaries and our special school, working with our students at the different phases, at the different transition points, to make sure that they have those positive destinations and those you know, they're developing those key career skills. Now, the rationale for us as doing that, you know, beyond what I've already just say, said, was, was for us, having those careers advisors working for the trust, working for our academies, working for our special school, 
was the impact that it has on our, our students first and foremost and you know I, I talk i'm a bit of a purist in this sense when i talk about careers at the heart of this it's all about the impact on our young people so having those careers advisors centrally with us meant that we can support them through their training they can prioritize the appointments knowing the students working with our academy teams making sure that those students who are in need of, of a careers guidance appointment most get seen as soon as is practically possible and we also wrote into our policy that they will get a minimum of one hour per appointment so that is a almost a, a matter of procedure for us now that every single careers guidance appointment has a minimum time allocation and that's really important for us from an impact and and a quality perspective what it's given us as well is is an increase in capacity um we we have now our team all, all year round so we do see as as most schools do we, we do see our year 11s at the start of year 11 but the increase in capacity means that we can also see students on multiple occasions for follow-up appointments we see students in year 10 before they transition into year 11 and we also see you know students most at risk of NEAT more frequently at earlier stages of intervention so we've we've grown that capacity and what our uh, careers advisors do is they also manage an internal quality assurance process so they quality assure each other's work which for us is really powerful because actually all three of our advisors come from different backgrounds we've got one from a connections background one from he one who's sort of grown through the school system so we've got different expertise different student client groups that they've worked with before so they're able to share that practice which for us is, is really really powerful what we do with our advisors is is we do ensure they are cdi members um and and part of that is making sure that, that they conform to the code of ethics that for us is important because it's safeguarding their independence it's safeguarding their impartiality they're not used to recruit to our post 16 provision for example or anything like that they are there to offer that independent and impartial guidance to our students. And, and the CGI really safeguards that and protects that, whilst also coming back to impact and quality, it ensures that they get access to the training and the resources through the CDI. What we also do as an organisation, um, and this is in collaboration with, with the Complete Careers team, is we run a career development professional apprenticeship. So I mentioned we are an apprenticeship provider. One of the apprenticeships that we run is the career development professional apprenticeship. Currently within our schools, we have two apprentices on that programme. Um, we've had others complete the apprenticeship and they're finished, but we've got two active apprentices on the, the programme. And that for us goes back to that first first point. It ensures we have the capacity. It ensures that the quality is is there because we're training them through through what is a, a really high quality apprenticeship, really high quality program. And it's it's also making sure we're having a real positive impact on our students when we're meeting with them. As well as the central support for careers guidance, we also have an employer engagement lead working across the trust, and that's sort of funded in part by our careers work but also the apprenticeships work and and the post-16 work that we're doing so we employ an employer engagement lead we know how difficult this is as an area and how much of a burden on careers teams time this was before we made the move and what we found is, is we had at the time six secondaries but our special school our primary academies our apprenticeships team reaching out to the same employers time and time again so what it's enabled us to do is, is establish that single point of contact for our, our employers. And, you know, I'm talking here, I know this isn't an option for, for every, you know, independent school, standalone academies, but, but it's certainly a model that, that having that point of contact in the academy in your school, um, it, it still stands true. It's enabled us to have that point of contact to work proactively with employers to make the best use of employers' time but also to collaborate with other agencies who are engaging with the same businesses. So we work closely with the University of Lincoln. We work closely with the CEC and our enterprise coordinators who you know, we know they're doing an excellent job engaging with employers. What we don't want to do is duplicate that work for our businesses. We want to make sure it's, it's very complementary. And again, it's, it's there to protect the quality of experiences that our students and our employers are having with us. And that 
predominantly comes through the work we're doing with work experience. So our employer engagement lead works very proactively with employers to ensure that the engagement they're having through work experience is a high quality encounter of the workplace. So we, we run a, you know, sort of a hybrid model of work experience. We have different models that, that we deliver. We do do individual placements. And again, as a trust, we centrally coordinate the risk assessment of those placements, for example. So we do the safeguard and assurances. We do the health and safety checks through this body of work, through this delineation of responsibility to allow our careers teams on the ground time to work with the students we want to be bogged down in the bureaucracy of that side of things. So we manage the, the risk assessments. But for those students who aren't accessing individual placements, our employee engagement lead is liaising, is um, negotiating, is, is networking with businesses to, to get workplace visits. And for us, this has been such a magnificent model of work experience because it's enabling us to get into businesses that either haven't got the capacity to offer individual placements or just want that that almost greater reach of, of students. What we're a, able to do is take groups of 10, 12, 15 students genuinely passionate about a sector into that industry. And that's all the work of, of our employer engagement lead. What that lead's also doing is, is lining up trying to um, identify opportunities for apprenticeships progression for our, our students. And that is, again, through our provision. So as prior apprenticeships, as a provider, lining up um, opportunities to stay with us um, through prior apprenticeships, but also going elsewhere. So working with those providers that run apprenticeships with other providers, have their own apprenticeships program, making sure we're putting them in front of our students because we know that they're interested in apprenticeships. The challenges come when it's... You know, when we're trying to find them um, and, and that's that's the piece of work that we do to really delineate that responsibility um, around our schools but also within the central support that, that we offer and that leads me on to you know our teams on the ground so that's sort of the the umbrella support that we're offering to decisions we made in terms of staffing models to have those careers advisors working across the academies um, and also having our employee engagement lead working across the trust. We also have very, very excellent careers teams. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I could talk all day about how, how brilliant our careers teams really are at coordinating the provision, at leading this work um, and, and supporting us as a trust team to make sure that, that what we're offering them is meeting theirs and their students' needs. So at the moment, we, we have seven careers teams. We have six and our six secondaries and our special school has a, a, a careers staffing structure, careers team over there. And the way we structure that team is, you know, it, it, it's quite a common structure in that we have a careers lead in each academy. Our careers leads are SLT links. The, uh, the concept there is they are that strategic driver for our careers provision. They are there to support our careers coordinators, our advisors, our employee engagement lead. They are there to make sure that the program is operating as it should, it's compliant, and to work through the mechanisms that we have as a trust. What they then have working in their team are our careers coordinators who are operational. They are empowered to drive a program as they see fit for their cohort of students we have very different settings within our academies our coordinators know our students better than any of us know them so they they are empowered to drive and sculpt their programs it's not a one size fits all and they are supported by our careers leads they're supported by our trust team i think that's really important for us as a a structure that we have the support but we also feel supported across the board um, as, as a network of, of a careers team. So we do have a cross-trust network. Our careers teams meet. Um, we meet quarterly throughout the year. That, you know, again, that, that's a luxury we have of being in a trust. I think it's important to network across the profession. I think we all have similar barriers. We all have similar challenges. But that's where we get that support network and our teams do feel supported by working with with each other but but also outside of, of our organization what we are very passionate about as well is is making sure that the responsibility for careers is shared around our other staff so we are not a siloed team within our academies 
we we see careers as this golden thread that, that is running through through all of our schools. And that goes back to that concept of our trust mission is to improve the life chances of our pupils. To do that, careers has to be part of the fabric of the organisation. But for that to happen, all of our staff have to see the value of, of our careers provision. So our teachers, they they embed careers into their curriculum. Now, some do it better than others. Some, you know, we're always innovating. We're trying to create um, better solutions to that. But the embedding of careers into our curriculum is, is so important. But also having that awareness of what careers is. What is it for our teams? What, what are our different roles doing? What's the difference between the careers advisor and our coordinators? And making sure that they have that awareness of, of the role that careers has in supporting students through their education and journey and beyond. Our pastoral teams are, are naturally heavily involved. They support our careers advisors and our coordinators in identifying students who need guidance appointments sooner rather than later, so that prioritisation of careers guidance. They do a lot of work with us around our destinations and our tracking and monitoring of Year 11s, year 13 students in, in their transition into positive destinations. Our SLT, they're there to support us. I talked about that support and them being supported. Our SLT are there to support us, but also to trust us, that they, they trust their careers teams to, to do what is needed. And that's the importance of that careers lead link for us is, is they have that person who has that strategic oversight, but also who they therefore can, can put that trust in in their team to drive the careers provision. And I heard John mention two minute warning there, Alice. Thank I'm you, Janet. Um, I, I heard John mention the importance of governors in, in the latest guidance. We do have linked governors for careers, um, but also we have a trustee who, who has ownership of careers. And again, they're there to empower us to drive our provision, but also to hold us accountable. So throughout this, you know, we've got people holding us to account in this structure to make sure that when meeting our provider access legislation obligations, we are delivering careers guidance and we're delivering a high impact programme. And I've talked about trust staff. So, so I'm part of the trust. We have our employee engagement lead part of the trust. But but we do go beyond that. Um, you know, we have a, a safeguarding lead for the trust. They support us on the work experience delivery to make sure we're compliant. We have a health and safety lead who supports us with, with work experience. So we draw on the resource that exists within our organisation to really sort of share that burden and share that accountability across our team. I suppose this, this slide is to say, you know, we, we're not there. Um, you know, we, we, I'm not presenting today as if this is a finished product for us. As well. I just wanted to share this as, as a model that exists, that, that we've invested heavily and in. this is what it can look like. But we, we're still stretched. And I know I'm, I'm speaking to really people who are going, crikey, there's, there's a lot of resource there we're really stretched and, and I, I, I do, you know, we've come from that position ourselves. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, we know we're having an impact and, and you all know you're having a really positive impact. What we want to do is, is know that we're having an impact whilst distributing the responsibility and support. So for us, there's a lot of things on the horizon that, that's going to test us and, and further advance this. We are a T-levels provider. Um, I always say it with bated breath. Breath. We're really excited by T-levels actually. And, um, we will be providing a suite, a portfolio of programmes from September and our careers team will be so integral to the rollout of that for the awareness and the understanding of what they are, but also working through our employers and making sure that they are high quality. We, we've launched a destination strategy that is truly delineated. That is not the sole responsibility of our careers teams. Uh, and that's that's a message that's so important um, ac across all of our strategies. But our destination strategy is is the first that really tests this this message that we're more than just a careers team. Um, that this goes far beyond our coordinators and our careers lead. That that we need the support of everybody in in delivering that. We do continue to to accredit through Career Mark. We've got some schools due for renewal, so, so they will be renewing this year. We've got another school due to go through the process for the first time. That's so important to us to, to provide that that quality standard, that that assurance again that, that what we're doing is having an impact, that this model is working. So, so that will come. And primary is arriving. So we are establishing a primary careers team to further delineate this responsibility 
to make sure that students coming to the secondary have got that grounding in, in career. So our primary careers to inform this academic year, and we're really excited to see how that sculpts the future of our careers provision at, at the Trust. Um, I'm conscious I'm, I'm a minute over, so um, I, I believe I'm in the Q&A later. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to answering any questions. Um, and as always, I'm a bit of a careers nerd. So if, if anyone does want to reach out privately, please, please do, because I'd, I'd love to talk about models and, and how we can share share practice. But thank you for listening, um, and I will see you in a little while. No, thank you very much, Alice. That was really, really helpful. And um, it's great to hear you talk about what a trust can do and how you can be empowered if, if a trust is working really effectively across those areas. And we come across schools sometimes who maybe not aren't part of a trust, but are maybe APs or what have you partnering up in different ways. So even if you're not part of a trust, there may be schools local to you that you can consider how to, 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 to work with in order to kind of um, save yourself work basically and, and make sure as you say, those employers aren't getting fatigued by, by too many requests, et cetera. Um, the next speaker I'm really pleased to introduce is Tom Corey. Um, Tom was, um, I suppose, crowned Careers Leader of the Year. Um, he'll be a bit embarrassed by me saying that. Um, but he's going to talk to you today about, about how no careers leader is an island. And I think that's a really interesting theme that um, we'll probably be going through this conference that actually the huge weight of expectations cannot sit on one person alone. And as Ellis showed us just in his speech, in his, in his presentation just now, even a school and a map that is very, very well resourced, there's always more that can be done. So it's about knowing when you're doing a lot and taking some of those positive, um, positive thoughts as, as we were being encouraged to do earlier. So I'll hand over to you, Tom. And again, two minute warning at the very end, but um, we won't scold you too much if you run over. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, hopefully everybody can see what I've got up on screen there. Um, yeah, we can see that clearly. That's wonderful. great. Wonderful. Happy days. I'll start there. Um, just to start off with, um, one of the easiest wins I've found recently is going for AI. So this whole presentation picture-wise has been generated by AI for me. I just typed in what I wanted each slide to look like, and it pinged it all up for me wonderfully. So if anybody does need some quick wins for presentations and assemblies, I can strongly recommend it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, just to give you a bit of a heads up, I'm a bit of a storyteller. I'm um, a drama graduate with a science degree as well. Um, so I start off as a science teacher. So a lot of my slides are very much story based. Um, they don't have all the lovely facts and figures that everybody previously has had. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, I guess a good place to start is to, is to say thanks again to Ellis, because I think actually we have a very similar approach to how our trusts work. We We've recently had a huge, huge buy-in from our trust um, in terms of careers and that the enriching side of, of education. So um, a big program has been running for the last two years we call um, Learning Without Borders, um, and it's run across our entire trust, um, which is this idea that actually education is so much more than the classroom. There's, there's loads of other stuff going on. There's loads of fantastic things for students to be engaging with that some of it is in the classroom, some of it's outside the classroom, some of it is part of that hybrid learning approach. Um, and again, we 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 also run this idea of a golden thread, although um, I've recently coined it as the bay leaf in the soup, um, which is that careers is the bay leaf. It's really intangible to anybody that doesn't know it's there. But if it's not there, you kind of it's not as rich and it's not as lovely a source as you would have had otherwise. Um, and so it's that kind of that hidden element to every part of every lesson, that every part of every student experience that goes through their education. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really nice that actually we we have some really lovely similarities bouncing between there. So let's start off. Um, I've started off with um, one of my favourite questions to ask employers, to ask students, to ask teachers. Uh, anybody that will let me speak or let or speak with me is what is your journey? I love, love stories. I love hearing stories. I love sharing stories with students um, and I think actually knowing your story and knowing the journey that you've been on is a really really crucial one um, you it allows you to identify your place within your school within your trust within your teams um, and it it really helps to know other people's stories as well to know where they've come from and what journeys they've been on as well um, to give you a bit of a context to my story, um, I'm really incredibly privileged to be one of the uh, founding members of a school in Chertsey. Um, we opened up uh, back in 2017. Um, but because of that, it's meant that I've been at the heart of the school ever since. Um, and so I know the school. I'm part of the school's journey. I've been able to weave careers in from a very early 
um, kind of phase of our of our process of developing the whole curriculum and developing our ethos. And so actually the careers education at Chelsea High School is so much more than what people see when they look at websites or when they look at policies. It's actually embedded into everything we do. Um, I think it's also important to know your department's journey. What was your predecessor doing? What journey had they been on previously? Where had they left you when you picked up your role? Um, knowing what's been done before and knowing the successes and the pitfalls of the people that have come before you is going to be crucial when it comes to knowing what you can take forward and what you can use to further develop. Um, and again, what's the school's journey? Where is the school looking? Is your school um, lucky enough, um, like one of ours, where we heavily invest in the careers department? Or are you one of those schools that is having to still fight that uphill battle to uh, try and show the quality of your provision? Um, and it's often quite hard to, to know where you sit within that, um, particularly if, like me, you start off as a middle leader and you're continuously having to seek upwards for permission, as it were, to, to get the next project running or to, to get the next event going. Um, and then arguably the most important journey of all is what are the journeys of your students? Knowing where your common destinations are, knowing what students are up to two years, three years, five years after they've left, keeping contact with those students and making sure that the relationships you have with them aren't just you do your five years and you move on. It's actually you are part of our family, you are part of our school community. You might have left us um, and you might have done one year at one college, but actually you didn't enjoy it. And so we offer the service that any student can come back to us and book a meeting in with us um, and we will help them at any point over the next five years, 10 years, however long it takes for them to, to get where they need to go to. So having a good understanding of where students are at and where they're looking at going is also um, really, really helpful. So with that in mind, um, the, obviously the topic of my one is that we aren't an island. We we must rely on the people around us. Um, I would suspect if we did a poll that um, and asked you to tell me how many hours you have explicitly dedicated to your role, it's probably not going to be a huge amount. When I first started my role, I had uh, two hours a week dedicated to this role. Um, alongside running a tutor group. Um, I also ran a second department in the school as well. Um, I was massively overloaded. Um, and it wasn't until I started fighting, it wasn't start until I started pushing that I realized that actually we can ask for more. We are essentially the whole purpose of a school. Schools are, I mean, depending on how you look at it philosophically, we're either uh, a place where qualifications are gained or places where we raise young adults um, and sometimes a, and possibly a hybrid of the two. So knowing um, that actually we can speak to our staff with that frame of mind, talking about that education is more than gaining grades at the end, can often help shift that mindset. So a um, couple of questions to think about, a um, couple of questions to possibly ask yourself or to, um, or to consider is whereabouts within the school structure do you sit? Are you a central character? Um, are you somebody that has a huge amount of time dedicated to your role or are you um, somebody a little bit more on the peripheries within the school network that actually has to go out and actively seek um, where you're going um, again like I said I was very privileged in my case that I was part of that opening family of people that started the school off and it meant that I was able to become very central within that network I learned a lot more processes than I needed to know um, so I swatted up very much on the GDR, GDPR processes, on our safeguarding processes, on our MIS software processes, so that I had a very vast understanding of the school. I became the staff governor. I joined a local secondary school as their governing body as well and made sure that I was aware of as many different things beyond my own scope that I could. Um, and in doing so, it gives you access to little pockets of expertise and little pockets of information that you can grab hold of and you can run with. So looking at where you are and where you sit within your organization and where those little pockets are you can pull from are, are so, so valuable. If you've got a pastoral team um, who are very, very good at, say, um, ensuring that attendance is hot, but actually they are lacking, say, in the outcomes of students or looking at that four, five, or three, four threshold in their results, then maybe look at seeing where you can add support in that area to help boost your profile among that team. Again, it does cost a little bit of extra time, but knowing where you can share your expertise beyond your role is, is fantastic at helping prove your worth amongst other uh, teachers, amongst other staff, but also getting your profile within the school uh, uh, more visible uh, and bigger. Um, again, 
you need to become that central role. You need to be the person that people turn to and ask for that little bit of advice, that little bit of information um, and get your name kind of pushed out there a little bit further. Um, my last head teacher gave me the advice is that people aren't going to sing your, people aren't going to be your, um, your megaphones. They aren't going to shout your name from the rooftops and tell everybody else what you're doing. You need to do it yourself. You need to be your, your biggest advocate. You need to share what it is you're doing with all the people around you so they can see where your expertise lies. Um, that kind of goes on to my next one, which is, um, and I appreciate it kind of contradicts a huge amount what's been going on previously, but it's very much my, not my philosophy, but how I approach a lot of things in life, which is make time for everyone. Make time for students, make time for parents, make time for your support staff, make time to chat to the ladies in the admin office or the gents in the admin office, make time to speak to the uh, guys in the canteen, get to know everybody, have time for everyone. Um, you never know where you're going to need to call in a favour. You never know where you're going to need to uh, do a favour to somebody so that you can call it back later on. Um, it's about becoming present in more than just your localised area. Um, I'm sure we'll all agree some of the best head teachers we've ever worked for are the ones that are never in their office and they're permanently on the floor, pacing the corridors, in and out of classrooms. Um, and it's the same mentality. Be present, be seen, be everywhere. Um, and then that way you become more involved in that network. You start to build and reach out towards it as well. Um, the next question, I suppose, is where where do you sit? As in where what teams are available within your school? What kind of school structure do you have? Um, we very much have quite a large senior leadership team at our school. Um, and each of those members of that team oversee particular areas. Um, some of them we have uh, each member has a dedicated year group. And pastoral team, our pastoral teams below that have dedicated uh, assistants to their heads of year and tutors. Um, and then we also have student support services that all come under that giant umbrella. So it's knowing who's doing what role within each aspect um, can really, really help again when it comes to knowing who to reach out to. Um, for example, when it comes to looking at my, uh, my Ronnies and my Neats, I know that I'm not necessarily going to my head of year 11. Now, they may know the students best but they know them best as a year group. What I want to be doing is I'm reaching out to my student services team um, and approaching them and booking in meetings with them and catching up with them with regards to, right, which students have been on your radar more recently? Which students have you noticed are turning up persistently late to X, Y, and Z? Which students have come to you with more friendship issues or more behavioral issues? And you start to build up this kind of additional picture with a team that you may not have directly gone to originally. And so we can start to uh, build on kind of relationships there. Equally with my governors, I'm uh, I'm frequently requesting that my governor comes into school to have a chat, just to catch up, see what's going on, show them where we're up to in our program, show them where we're at year to date, and basically invite them to pull it apart, invite them to offer alternatives, invite them to use their network to, to enhance our one, um, and really, really, really trying to make the most of other people's relationships as well. So as soon as you get the, as soon as they've introduced you to somebody else, that's branched out your network. It gives you one extra person that you can start moving on to and talking to. Um, equally, it was through speaking to our catering team that we now have a permanent student in work experience. Just as an ongoing relationship with our catering team, we now have uh, at any given time at least one year ten or one year eleven student um, coming out of a couple of lessons a fortnight to work with our catering team to work in our canteen. Uh, helping prepare food um, and then from there it, it's one of those that they may or may not go into catering when they uh, leave education when they leave our education but what they've done is they've been able to work within a team within a team of adults they've been able to use communication skills dexterity skills and all the rest of it that they wouldn't have been gaining in other aspects of their education um, so my message here really is is basically do your research for your own school if you're new to the role spend a bit of time in a staff room on one of your free periods if you have a quite a, a heavy staff room ethos in your school um, or spend time before school just mooching about other people's classrooms catching up with people working out what everybody's up to and just being being a bit more present and being a bit more available um then it kind of goes on to my my next or my previous point i should i suppose being your largest advocate using these guys using uh, complete careers to get your careers mark. I cannot stress enough how valuable a resource like this is. Genuinely, it's it was an absolute game changer for me in my career. 
being able to use um, the the whole process of uh, working towards the careers mark completely change the shape of our um, of our careers program. What it allowed me to do was find what I was good at. I was able to find my niches, find my little areas of expertise, find what I bring to the careers program that made me better than local schools. And then when I did a bit more research, what made me better than national. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm better than national in a lot of areas. It's a very few minute areas that I'm very proud of. However, there were areas that I was able to prove and justify to my stakeholders that this is something that we as a school are exceptional at. This is what we do that no one else does. And Complete Careers uh, and the Careers Mark allowed me to do that. I, I must say I'm not advertising for this. So I'm not getting paid and there's no kickback for it. Um, I just think the whole process of going through it was uh, absolutely invaluable. Don't get me wrong. It was hard work. It is hard work. Um, and um, we've got another couple of schools in the local area that I'm supporting with their process on this as well. Um, and they are finding that it is tough. But what it is doing is making them really dig down and look at what makes them unique and what makes them special and what get, makes their provision something that is better than than others in other areas. Um, once oh, you've just, found... just got a couple of minutes left there. Thank you. Thank um, you. Once you've found that, that's that's your selling point. That's what you can use as your weaponry. That's what you can take to your governors. That's what you can take to SLT. Um, and that's what you can do to show that you are worth investing in. You as a person, you as a department, you as a principal are worth investing in. And you can use that as your bargaining tip. You can use that as your request for more dedicated hours to the careers program. You can use it to justify bringing in additional support staff to help with the administration. You can use it to justify more outreach to bring uh, to work closer with other local secondary schools um, or whatever it might be, but it gives you an incredibly powerful bargaining chip that um, has done me no end of good over the past year or so. Um, all I'll say, and I think I'll probably finish off there, um, I hope that my general message here is that it's not, while we are very easily left to our own devices um, and while it can be very easy to tuck yourself up in your office uh, and keep yourself to yourself uh, plan a couple of things and send them out to other people to get on with and uh, work through paperwork and forms get out there and get speaking to people find your network find the people in your school that you can speak to that you can get experience from that you can get expertise from uh, and make yourself present and make yourself known thank you very much Thank you very much, Tom. And if you've got any questions for Tom or indeed Ellis, please pop them in the chat. Um, it was really, really good to hear, Tom, how how basically you're managing um, this careers provision. You may have a big team, you may not have a big team as a careers leader, but you're still having to create impact and to sort of spread influence. And that's a big part of, of, of that. It can be sometimes just networking with people already in your school, getting your face known. So careers has a bigger profile and you have a big profile within the school. Um, and that's something that, you know, obviously could be a priority, even if you only have a very, very limited amount of time, because then, you know, you're hopefully going to get people much more engaged with with doing things for you um, and, and being involved in admin support or careers across the curriculum or trip organising or whatever it is, because the profile of careers itself is so high. So that's wonderful, Tom. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Next up, we've got our own Janet Hutchinson, and she's going to be following on a little bit of things from some of the themes that, that Tom just brought up. Um, and the, the title of her presentation is Investing a Little to Gain a Lot. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this. Again, Janet, I'll give you a, a two minute warning if that's OK and hand over now to you. I think you might be muted, Janet, you might have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, I've shared my screen and now I've also unmuted myself. And unfortunately, like John, I'm clearing my throat. So I've got a little bit of time this morning to try and show you how we believe that, um, a bit like Tom said, investing in obtaining the quality and career standard, possibly using the career mark approach, um, will actually um, give you a very good return on investment. You will, <clears throat> you will have to invest both time and a little money or money, but it's about what you get for it. And thank you, Tom, in a way, for saying how it helped you 
The other thing, going back to various of the speakers, I think having something like this and the community it gives you access to can also help with your well-being. So looking at those jars, what I'm thinking is hopefully this is what you have to put in initially. And then slowly, as you go through the process, you'll see how I believe the jar gets fuller so that you're getting value for money and you're gaining a lot, if you like. It might not actually be coins, but it was the image I found. So assuming you are all here as something similar to a career leader, though you may also be a career professional or you may be something else within your organisation, but there is uh, an expectation, John talked about musts and shoulds early on, there is an expectation that each organisation has a career leader. And that in itself is an investment by the school because they've given somebody that job. Um, as part of that, there are shoulds and musts, I won't go over them, but you should have some sort of policy around that. And then we have the idea of practice. So the policy needs to involve the governors, the whole school, like any other policy. The practice, in theory, should also involve lots of other people and may be very different depending on the nature of your organisation. Again, from today, Ed was talking about having a takeaway. If you like, I'm also talking about having a takeaway from today. It may not be yet that you feel ready to be externally accredited, but is it something at least worth investigating? We have things like a self-assessment audit. We can put you in touch with other people. We have videos about it, etc. So what are your plans? Even if you don't even feel ready for that, you should have some plans. What are you going to go back and try and do? And then how are you moving forward? So that's your first little bit of investment, the career leader. Now, I don't know why that's still sticking out. Let me see if I can get rid of that. Um, thing at the top. Never mind. I don't seem to be able to. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm whizzing through slides. So the benefits of the quality standard. This is a little list we give you. You will get these slides, so I won't read them all out separately. But it is independent validation by external experts. Um, again, we've talked about very briefly, the philosophy behind what is education? Is it to get qualifications or to prepare people for life? I'm an ex-teacher and qualifications I know are important, but preparing people for life is even more so. There is evidence that shows careers, increases engagement, motivation and achievement. Um, also, those people doing the quality and career standard may well have more Gatchby benchmarks. So, again, that looks good in whoever's measuring those for you. And hopefully, by doing something like this, you may look further and more outward and involve more people so that everybody is involved in your learners' futures. So we have a community that is Career Mark membership. They are invited to things like this no-cost conference, but we also have newsletters, etc. And the other thing that I think I would like to make as a clear point, when you do get an external assessment, part of what you get back is a report identifying what's strong but also using your assessor's expertise, bearing in mind they are a qualified practicing career professional who may well have visited and found out about lots of different organizations and can share ideas. They will make recommendations for things they think will help you improve your program. So, again, it's somebody else saying, yeah, you're doing loads of great things, but have you thought about? 
and sometimes you haven't. And again, you're looking, therefore, to come out with confident, empowered learners aiming to achieve their potential. So, as I say, Compass is part of your processes anyway. Compass tool is something we need you to do at the start of committing to this process. So a little bit of time or a little bit more time is required to update your Compass assessment. There are people to help you. And then on our website, you can download self-assessment checklist. Initially, it doesn't have to be very detailed, but it gives you a snapshot of the things we're looking for and the opportunity to reflect and think, are we good at that? Are we doing some of that? Aren't we doing that? So maybe we need to. And OK, we're beginning to do that, but we need to do a lot more. Again, in terms of cost, we have unfortunately had to recently raise the cost for our version of the quality standard. But I just wanted to point out, I used to be both an English and a maths teacher, so the mathematician in me likes doing bits of sums, is if you have a three-form entry with years 7 to 11, then effectively acquiring the quality and careers standard costs £1.50 for each of those learners. Now, many of you may be at bigger schools, some may be at smaller, but it just gives you an idea. You're also already being tasked to achieve the benchmarks and the standard is fully compatible and in some areas goes beyond. And we have a particular model that we think is helpful and help you to develop and give you a clear framework. Again, to remind you some of what Don might have flagged up, the DfE does strongly recommend that all schools and colleges work towards the standard. That's not us making it up, that's the DfE. So flag it to your SLT, flag it to your staff, flag it to your governors. There is a CEC impact review system, but they are assuring us it's not an alternative, but should prepare schools and colleges, if you like. It's a step along the way towards thinking about, do you want that professional externally validated quality award? And again, we've already mentioned Ofsted. They've shown a bit more interest, and it is very pleasing that we get feedback often from career mark um, credited schools where the coordinator or the career lead as now will say well Ofsted came in but I had my folder of evidence or I got my documentation we've got the quality award so basically they're happy with what we do so in a way it can take pressure off you and you've got a quick win if you like for Ofsted so there's some of the things you will be gaining. The CDI may also be there to help you. So you can join as a member, whether you're a qualified career professional or not. The people delivering guidance to your learners should be on the professional register and they should be part of the CDI. So you have these people around you and therefore hopefully you begin to feel you're filling your jar or a smiley happy person having a cup of coffee and chatting to other people about your work. As Tom also said, nobody else will blow your trumpet but you in some ways. Again here, when we look at the self-assessment or any other part of it, these are people who you can involve. So just a few of them at the least. All your staff, and I don't just mean teaching staff, support staff and other staff can be invaluable. Again, Tom talked about working with the catering company for work experience. You may have in-house catering. You can still use them for work experience. Site managers and maintenance teams, they can be used. Your admin staff 
can be used. All these people can get involved. So it's not just the academic staff, it's everybody else, down to cleaners, gardeners, you name it, whoever it is. Anybody who comes into your organisation might be useful as a stakeholder. If you're having building work done, can they talk to your learners about it? If you're having painting and decorating done, can they talk to your learners about it? If the window cleaner comes in, can you talk about how he set up his own company, etc.? So get loads of people involved. It's not just you. Again, your family. Are there people in your family who could do you a talking head? I know people can't always give time necessarily to come into your school or even to remotely come into your school, but maybe they can give you two or three minutes to talk about their job and create a little video that you can collect. Same with governors. Who do you link with in the local community? Employers locally, employees, your ex-pupils. They can be a hugely invaluable source. Again, maybe getting them to fill out a questionnaire or do a talking head. And you've also got enterprise advisors. So all these people can help and support you. And when you come, therefore, to look at the actual nitty gritty, both Ellis and Tom talked about the sort of idea that careers is central, a golden thread or the Bailey or whatever. I think in some ways it's the purpose of education careers. It also, Tom also used the word weaving it in, and I think that's quite important. So you get to what the measures are that we are looking for. Management is really important. So it's not just you, it's other areas of the school. It might be citizenship, SHE, it's all your subject leaders. It's the past pastoral staff, the special needs department, how are you all working together to record and manage and plan to help your learners? Who's giving advice and who's giving guidance? Again, they are two slightly different things and a bit like Ed said at some point, we could have a whole session on that, but they are different and you need to be clear about who's giving it and what their boundaries are and who's coming in to do it. Then you've got information. Now that can come from a vast variety of sources. Um, and Google has its uses. We all go there to ask questions, but also you need to make sure that learner is aware of what sort of information is valuable and useful and what is, if you like, not quite as independent, impartial, Etc. So helping them to understand research skills and evaluate so that they can make well-informed, realistic decisions. Again, when you've got guidance, people, um, at least from Priory, talked about the year 10s are accessing it before they're in year 11. I think that's an excellent idea. The DfE and guidance suggest when they make significant decisions. So again, at options for some young people, those can be difficult choices. They need independent, impartial guidance. Again, the last on my list of four here is to me a hugely important one. They're all important, but sometimes this gets slightly overlooked. What are you trying to teach learners that comes under the heading of careers? Because it's not just attitudes and skills, it is also knowledge, knowledge of self, knowledge of learning pathways, knowledge of opportunities and how the world of work is changing, knowledge of what they might be able to do and how they might be able to do it and how realistic that is. So every event or interaction they have with the workplace or an employee 
what is it you want them to learn and how are they recording that and action planning to move through their future and think, okay, now I know that, I don't want to do that, for example, or I'd quite like to investigate that further. So how do they go about doing that? So those are your four standards. We provide support materials online. Again, it's our approach. They're supported online. So you will see how, hopefully then, sorry, just more briefly, different policy documents if you need them, entitlements. Um, and we can also offer personal support through our career mark champions. Jenny mentioned being involved. What she didn't say is she's one of our very, very useful career mark champions. We also have primary expertise now because we do do a primary quality award. So if you have primary schools interested, we can also talk through how careers can be embedded there. So we're gaining more. And then this is what a career leader said about the thing. Tom told us something, but again, it's a positive experience. It produces a structured framework. It's key areas identified. When you are being assessed, you can talk to your assessor. And they will be talking to your learners before they award the standard. They'll have looked at your evidence and then they come in and talk to your learners. When I say come in, we do now do this all remotely because we believe that is better for the environment, better for the uh, economic consequences and indeed better for the learners in that they get the experience of talking to a professional on a remote platform. So you also get the opportunity to raise careers in school because everybody needs to know what's going on and you get a whole school approach. So you this know, Janet, you've just got two minutes left. Yep. This is what we then have when you come to the end. We talk, as I say, to your learners, making sure we do it in an appropriate manner. We work with a whole range of schools and colleges. So we do work with special needs learners and we always make sure we talk with them appropriately. So that's how, what happens. And then you get expert feedback and recommendations for continuous improvement. And here's an example, of briefly, the sort of thing you might get as a recommendation. Make sure somebody gets regular support from a governor or board member. Reflect on the time allocated to lead the careers provision. One career leader did actually ask me to recommend that they be made a member of the SMT because it was so important. I said, well, I can't actually do that. That's outside my remit, but I can ask them to review the importance they put on being a career leader. Staff training, and I know that that's really difficult to get, but for careers, it's hugely important with the CDI framework and such like. So get that in the program. And then what are you doing to make sure you're sharing good practice internally? So we can help you move forward. So you're using your external expertise to gain internal leverage and hopefully then you will feel you've got a return on your investment and you've invested significantly less than the amount you've gained. Thank you. I will take questions at the end like everybody else and answer anything if you wish. Thanks very um, much, Janet. Sorry, Bonja. Yes. Lovely. Thank you very much, Janet. And please feel free to put questions in the chat for Janet um, around about the quality and career standards and, and using CareerMark. As she said, I, I am a CareerMark champion myself and as an, an assessor. But when I was working myself as a careers leader in schools, I know that the recommendations made in my reports, I could then take to the leadership team and actually have real action on one. So one was the fact that my office was in an out of the way place. It was put as a recommendation. I was moved front and centre. And another one was to consider how I was line managed because I I was going to be removed one step away from SLT and the recommendation meant that that, that did 
didn't happen. So as Janet says, we can't perform miracles, but we can um, ensure that you're, um, you know, you're using this tool, the recommendations in your report as, as advocating for what you need. So with that, we have now got another comfort screen break. So you can make yourself another cup of tea or stretch your legs. And we'll be coming back for the speakers panel at quarter past 12. So we'll see you again at 12.15. Hello to everybody and welcome back from your break. Perhaps you managed to get down a little bit of very quick lunch, perhaps not. Um, I saw that one of our colleagues was actually doing lunch duty, which I'm going to touch on in a moment. So um, hopefully you're not having to do that this lunchtime and you've been able to grab a bite for yourself. So the next part of the conference and, and coming around to its conclusion is the panel, where we're going to be hearing from um, those speakers who you've already heard from, from Ed, from Tom, Ellis and Janet. Um, and we're going to be putting to them some questions that have been coming up in chat or some general comments and themes that seem to be coming out of the conference. We've also got John on there as well. So we should have John, Janet, and Ellis, Ed and Tom. And you should hopefully be able to see their faces in just a moment. Um, it's been really useful, I think, and these, the common themes are obviously coming out around about how people work effectively with a very short amount of time and the challenges that are facing them in terms of balancing their work and also balancing that with alongside their own mental health, their own, um, their own um, well-being in the workplace and outside of the workplace. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk, ask Ed probably the, the first question. Um, and it was it was generated from a comment which was which was from Hannah Wharton um, saying that she feels that by the end of the day, she is utterly exhausted, that she's putting her kids to bed. Um, that she's um, struggling with managing kind of home life in some ways and, and work life and, and feeling that sense of kind of being pulled in different directions. Um, I hope Hannah doesn't feel I'm putting words in her mouth, but I think a lot of um, career practitioners might feel this sense of perhaps guilt that they are not giving each area of their life as much attention as they would like to. And obviously this is common in other careers as well where, where people are really being stretched. So I guess my question um, to Ed, if he's there, is, is how can we deal with those feelings of, of guilt and being pushed in or pulled in different directions? It's a great question. I wish I had something that was a magic wand to say. You'll never feel guilty. You'll never feel kind of any shame or anything like that because the reality is we're all going to feel that way. Um, so, but I do want to kind of answer that as quickly as I possibly can. The first thing is that we need to recognise we're only human and that most other people, if they were living with that level of stress and strain, they would also struggle to do everything. And so some people will kind of use language that makes them feel worse. It creates what we call the inner critic. We're very critical of ourselves because we think we should be able to and we ought to to be able to, and we compare ourselves to other people in a negative way. But one of the things that might be helpful, and again, forgive me if it doesn't do it justice in a short answer, but to recognise that words change worlds. Words change worlds. So sometimes the narrative that we play out up here, instead of being helpful and healthy, it becomes unhelpful and unhealthy. So we can say things like, I've, I've done nothing today, or I feel bad because um, I've just kind of sat around. But what we don't realise is we might need to do those things to top our tank up in order to be able to cope. So Peter, uh, Paul Gilbert and other people talk about a compassionate mind, which is essential for us to just have a bit of kindness towards ourselves as well as other people. So whilst we might say the reality is you're going to be frazzled at bedtime, you're going to be frazzled at night, but there might be times if you look during your week um, and your months whereby perhaps you're not quite as frazzled. And what I've found to be true in my own life is that my wife and my kids will be patient as long as there's a plan. So we just say that again. They'll be patient as long as there's a plan. So the plan is that at the weekend you get dad back <laughs> because it's full on. And when we think about a work life balance it makes us feels like we're on a tightrope trying to do all things for all people and it's difficult but instead and I'm happy to share this more if it's helpful but there's a blend of life it's got lots of different things and so it might be that we have to be heavily invested with work because that's what it requires during the week but if you can say 
I'm going to be in the room with you mentally, emotionally and physically on a weekend. We're going to do something together. I personally have seen it to be true. And I think it could be true in other people's lives to say children in particular, they'll be patient if they know when they have got your attention. Yeah. And if you can create that time, diarize it, prioritize. And here's the key to it. If you say you're going to do it, you have to do it. So you have to be available when you say you're going to. So don't beat yourself up. Don't let your inner critic give you a hard time. Reality rules for people. Try and be as present as you can while you're there, but create some time and some space when they know that your head and heart is actually with them. I hope that goes some way in a very short period of time to answer that. No, that was really good. It's the idea that we actually do have to compartmentalise. We have to make a plan for, for different things to happen. Absolutely, that's great. I've just realised as well, I'd failed to introduce John earlier as a panel member. I do apologise, John. You're also there and I will direct some questions to you. Um, I suppose the next thing I'd like to talk about is sort of moving on a little bit from, from, from what um, Ed has been saying is that what, what one of the themes that's come out of today is that you know, we can't possibly be working um, independently on our own. As Tom says, no person is an island. Um, and I suppose what I want to, to ask possibly possibly Ellis initially and then Tom is, is, you know, in terms of spreading responsibility, how would you initially go about that? And how did you sort of first identify one initiative that had a high level of, of impact? So what would you say is the one thing when you started in your role, Ellis first and then Tom, that you could put in place that had a high level of impact, despite probably at that point not having a great deal of time? Mm, yeah, so... Yeah, for, for us, it, in terms of what, you know, where, where did we start? Where did we start? We, we did quite a, you know, we, we quite, we tried to step back, I suppose, and, and had that bird's eye view of, of what was going on across our careers programme and where the biggest use of our time was going that could be streamlined or, or, or better used. And that, that I suppose, was, was the, the birth of the conversation about the central employment for us of careers advisors and an employer engagement lead because we said well our careers teams are so frequently coordinating careers guidance for students um and ultimately we want our careers teams in front of students rather than you know not seeing them so um it, it started there and then you know we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to get into businesses with you know low low success rates so we, you know we 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 took two key things and, and and we we moved them forward. That was sort of the February to, to July part. And then, you know, we got back around the table and said, okay, what's next? And it was work experience as, as for many of us it will be. So we sat down and, and looked at what is the plan, the project plan to move us forward. I think what I'd say is it, it didn't happen overnight. So we, we we, we've rolled one year out of a work experience strategy and we are in a much healthier position now than we were a year ago, but it took us a long time and this year will look different again and next year we'll innovate further. But I think we've got to give ourselves the chance to say this is going to take a year, it's going to take two years mm -hmm. for us to really see the impact and the benefit of streamlining the process, etc. And that's that's where we're at. So we, we made the changes, but but we accepted that it would take us time to then actually implement it and see the benefits of making those changes. Lovely. Thanks, Ellis. And I mean, Tom, sort of same question for you. You said initially you'd started with a very, very small amount of time. If you had to give an idea of one thing that, you know, starting up with a very small time allocation, you would prioritise in terms of a, a career leadership within the school. What do you think you would do? So um, our initial big thing was reaching out to all of our post-16 providers that we had available to us um, and started to delegate responsibility to my heads of year teams to give them responsibility or give them the charge of bringing in these uh, sick forms or colleges or vocational colleges um, into school to speak to our students. Um, a lot of it is very low maintenance on behalf of the request I was asking of the staff. Um, but the impact was huge. So it meant that over the first year, we had 15 different colleges and, and course providers coming in, speaking during assembly slots. Uh, from their point of view, it was a couple of emails. It also meant they didn't have to plan the assembly that week. Um, and from a, a bigger picture point of view, it meant they were able to shout about it on social media. We were a very small school to begin with, and we we're able to show that we're actively engaging and seeking out uh, local kind of opportunities for our students and trying to make ourselves uh, this community hub, which was part of our, our initial five-year project. 
Yeah. And I think it's sometimes not in careers professionals' natures to shout out about what they do. They can often be quite self-effacing, quite modest. But actually, when, you, when you're talking about raising the profile of careers across the school, that's actually what you need to do. Sorry, Janet, you had your hand um, up earlier. I know you've put something in chat, but I think it's definitely worth worth mentioning. Thank you, Jenny. Yes. No, I was, I was going to say, yes, I agree with what Ed said. I think the... Uh ability to prioritize your task what is the really important things or the ones that need doing first and ideally to delegate and then also not to feel guilty because you can't do everything all the time and you will have to make decisions about what you can and can't do mm -hmm. and for a good return on your investment that's the other thing for the learners and for yourself Yes, and I think that that came up again. The, the, the sort of you have to you have to no matter how good your career's provision is, um, as, as as Tom and kind of Ellis was saying earlier, particularly Ellis with with the amount of investment, and in, there's always more that you can do. So it's not like you will ever get to that point when you think I'm done. My career's provision is brilliant. I can sit back now. Those feelings of anxiety maybe am I doing enough can I do more possibly will always be there no matter how well resourced you are so it's a case of understanding as Janet says okay with what I've been given I've done a really good job I'm doing as best, best as I can and that brings me on to the next point which I'm going to first direct to Ed but I think it's something I'd like Tom and Ellis um, to comment on as well which is obviously one of the, the bigger themes that we're talking about is that you may have to have difficult conversations with individuals within the SLT team, within the governing body, or perhaps not difficult conversations, but certainly conversations that are asking them for more, for more time, for more resources, or explaining to them the limits of what you can do based on the time that you have and the money you have. Um, so I just wanted to ask Ed if you had any tips for advocating for yourself for other people. So saying, this is what I need. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I run a whole course on it. <laughs> Maybe another time I'll, I'll come along. Um, but I think it it's firstly, again, it goes back to that guilt. Is, is it just me? Is it because I'm asking too much? Is it because I'm not as proficient as other people? Is it that I'm not as effective as other people? And we begin to doubt ourselves. But when you are satisfied that it's a reasonable request, and you've got to that place of going, okay, I'm, I recognise that this is reasonable, it's now how do I present my case? So to speak with influence and impact is a skill that can be taught and can learn, that you can learn. But just very, very quickly, most people aren't confident when they speak because they're not competent. They haven't had to do it many times. So if you're kind of going, I feel really nervous, well, you will be because <laughs> you haven't had to do it regularly. And mm -hmm. in some way, as a governor of a school, I want to create an environment whereby the people that I'm supporting and encouraging from the head teacher, the rest of the team, including the careers professionals, I want them to be at ease and I want to make sure that they feel able to practice almost to then be able to put something across that might be hard to hear. Just one other thing, just very, very quickly, just recognize most people will not listen to you because most people don't. So when you satisfy that and realize most people are not listening, they're waiting for their chance to speak. And it's not your fault. It's just how they are because their head and heart is elsewhere. I've sent some resources over that people can have a look at. And some of that will talk about kind of how do I manage it? And I might send some more across. But when you kind of go actually with the best will in the world, it might not be the right time, the right environment, but I've just got to try my best. So rather than going, well, what's in it for them, selling it to them, all of that kind of thing, I would just say, may I have an opportunity to share with you something that's really important to me? And because it's important to me, I think it might be important to the young people and for the whole school. When would be a good time to have that conversation with you? And literally, if you can, without being manipulative, have your diary with you and commit to it. Because, again, people all say, yeah, that's really important. We'll make sure we get time. And you won't. Not because they don't care, but because they're busy people. So just pin them down and say, when would be a good time to have a conversation that's really important to me, to the young people that we're supporting, and to the whole school? And then when you begin to frame it that way, they've already thought this is important. Mm -hmm. I need to allocate time. 
And then it's a case of just presenting your case, which I haven't got time to go into. I'm sure Tom and Ellis can share some of their own experience. But again, I'm available offline um, if I, if any of that is of interest to people. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Ed. And I was going to come on to Tom next, just because you said um, a really good quote, which we like, which we can ask for more. And the sense of actually feeling, you know, that's OK to ask for more. It's not necessarily a failure. It's not necessarily something that we can do and we should do. So I'm wondering, Tom, and without probably disclosing too much, if you can think of any instances where you did go back to, to management and say, I need this, I need a bit more. Um, yeah, when we launched our work experience programme for the first time, um, it was at a point where I was working, uh, my capacity had increased slightly, I was up to around four to five hours per week, uh, dedicated to the role, and we wanted to launch work experience that year. Um, and um, it was a, very much a case of acknowledging I cannot do this on my own. If you would like work experience to run, I know the benefit. I can speak about the benefits till the cows come home. But if you want this to run, if you want our provision to be the best, or you know what strive to be the best, we need to have a work provision, a work experience provision in place. Um, I am going to need funding in order to carry this out. Um, I cannot do it alone. Um, and it was essentially just laying the facts straight flat out on the table. Um, it's one of those. It's a it's sort of putting the responsibility on the other party in that respect, um, mm -hmm. acknowledging that actually this is something that within my capacity I couldn't do. Um, however, with the right funding, with the right support, this is something that we can facilitate and we will make the most of. Um, and as a result, we we ran it to a huge success. Brilliant. Absolutely great. And um, that's, I think, it's you, you've got to sort of say, look, I, I, this is something I can do. This is something I can't do. And we need to be perhaps be more confident as career professionals to say, you know, you, we might not be able to get paid, but we might not be able to negotiate even for more time. But we can say, actually, you know, I can do this within the time and the money allocation, but I cannot do that. Um, obviously, this is a bit of a theme. Nicola Meek talks about being burnt out. And I just want to share Anne-Marie Marie Thompson was the lady who, who was doing lunch duty uh, as a careers leader right now. That's why she's not here. So there's always going to be this theme that, that we don't have, um, as careers leaders don't have enough time to, to really do what they want in their role. And I know, John, you were sort of talking earlier about the national climate being that there's clearly this understanding and a recognition that um, protected time would be useful, but sort of a feeling that actually it's very, very unlikely um, to be delivered. And I just wondered, in your experience, I know you're obviously a guidance professional and, and in terms of the quality and career standards, you know, what are the ranges in terms of the amount of time that some people have when it comes to managing careers in the school? And then also sort of when, if and when do you think anything will change when it comes to um, ring fencing either resources or time for careers leaders? That's a nice easy question there, Jenny. So thank Sorry. you. Sorry, <laughs> I'll um, just give you one big one. Yeah, no, but it's a really good one as well. I mean, I think, unfortunately, just looking at the the um, the stuff I shared earlier on about, you know, what was in the Education Select Committee's recommendation for protected time and for publishing that time on the website, and just the response from DfE, you know, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to, 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 to put into print a set amount of time, really. So I don't think that will come anytime soon at all. Um, I think that the scale, the continuum, really, for, for career leader time is pretty much from zero to, to full time. Um, but even when it's full time, it's not to say that that's sufficient. Far from it. You know, some obviously have, have a broader career team. And it's also about what is that role? Um, what, what are you asked to do in that role? Because if it's, you know, OK, I've got 200 year 11s to see for guidance and advice and plan work experience and all the other bits, you'll probably find that you have got half an hour or no time for careers leadership. So I think that's really important. I think, you know, what's also interesting, you know, just, just looking at the profession from, from uh, you know, from an external lens, if you can, for a moment, is that, you know, we are seeing a lot about, you know, of we, we are recognising quite a lot about the, you know, um, the, the need for guidance in terms of economic benefits, in terms of wealthy and benefits, in terms of labour market information, in terms of, you know, the sustainable uh, development goals and things like that. It's, you know, you can start to evidence the case from it from a number of different viewpoints. And also we can start to see in things like the Facebook career, uh, career community and uh, and online, 
you know, that we are advocating for the profession more now. You know, as career professionals, we've got a responsibility for stand up for ourselves and to be counted. And I think we'll see a lot more campaigns, certainly from the Career Development Institute over the next six to 12 months, really start and say, well, this is what careers development is all about. We've seen the so much more than just jobs campaign, for example. So there'll be more and more aspects like that. So I think we'll see more of a spotlight on it. Um, what kind of recognition it will it will receive from policymakers uh, in the short term might be limited. Mm -hmm. But in terms of recognising our worth and our value and recognising that we are at the moment, you know, a, a very in demand kind of resource you know there is a national shortage we've got a quarter of careers uh, professionals that might be indicating that they're looking to leave the sector so in a way you look at things from a demand demand uh, supply versus demand aspect you know you can be a bit more kind of uh, you know demanding you know in terms of your employer as to you know your worth and I think the last thing I'd say, if I may, Jenny, just just bringing coming back to, from what Ed's saying, which I've really enjoyed listening to Ed today. And I think, you know, when we're talking about coming back home with burnout and stuff and about managing that, we're all obviously very guilty of that at times. But I, I do think it's also about managing time within our workspace, you know, which I'm sure is, is um, implicit within that. But, you know. Some of Ed's messages around self-care isn't selfish and things like that is so true. But I really like to see career professionals bring that into their work to say, well, between nine and five or, or nine and three or whatever it may be, you know, can we just put aside some time for me? You know, just to say, I've got all these competing priorities kind of thing, all these pressures and then that's when you are going to go home, you know, having done as much as you possibly can, which is brilliant. OK, mm -hmm. but can we find an hour to kind of create that plan again that I think Ed said about for the weekend or something, but within within the work role to be able to plan to say, well, this is what I can do about it. This is how I can pull some things together. This is how I can actually take stock for a moment to be able to calm myself down think laterally and actually construct might just be that that three line email it might be to to the head teacher or the senior leadership team to say I really need to speak to you about something right. and then maybe just to summarize just those key points about what that might be rather than present them with everything because you haven't had the time to digest it and present it in, in an easy manner. So I, I, I think that's really important. And obviously without that, then, as you said, Jenny, it's about if you can't have that, you know, if, if, if it's falling on, 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 on closed ears for, um, for extra time, extra resources, extra pay, it's very much about accepting limitations and, and working within those. And again, informing your governor team and your senior leadership team to say well because of this this is what I can do and it means that this is the kind of things that I can't do and for me I think that's a healthy approach and mm. um, far far broader than the question you asked but um, no that was great no it's obviously great and you you brought up a really really interesting point John which is that you know I think on well, many interesting points but particularly that you know careers leadership time is different to careers time in total so actually it's quite a small amount of leadership time can be appropriate in some settings if you've got a team underneath you who are delivering guidance if you've got sufficient admin support if you've got naturally you know um, um teaching staff who are very very um with, with careers very very high on their agenda so it's not necessarily as simple as saying how much careers leadership time you have it's about the team under you and also the buy-in of the whole school. I've got a couple of very direct questions um, from Denise Manning. Um, one I'll send to Janet, first of all, because I know we're mindful of uh, running out of time, but this is um, about quality assurance of Gatsby Benchmark 4 in lessons. Um, actually, this might be a good one for, for, El uh, for Ellis and Tom as well, so maybe I'll start with them. Um, how do you quality assure Gatsby 4 is, is going on so that those curriculum links are being made? So perhaps, Ellis, could you give some ideas of how either individual careers leaders or across the trust you're ensuring that that uh, or, or steps are being taken to ensure that careers is delivered across the curriculum 
Yeah, so, so for us, it's, and, and this is, again, talking about the delineation of responsibility and you know, setting boundaries within our careers team. This is the role of our careers leads um, to, to drive the curriculum teams to ensure that they are delivering and embedding careers into the curriculum. We, we ask the academies to conduct their audits of careers in the curriculum. Now, confession, we, we are not there. Um, we do it. We do it well in some areas and not so well in others. Um, so we, we do conduct that audit. Um, what we do as a trust is, is we collaborate. So if we've got strong practice in some areas, how do we then roll that out um, a, a, across the, the subjects and our other academies? Um, what I'd also say is, is as a T-levels provider, we are almost duty bound to engage with industry to enrich our curriculum. So that is something that we're also doing to make sure that both our academic delivery staff and our technical delivery staff have that recent and relevant industry knowledge and occupational competence to enrich their curriculums. So we're engaging with training through the Education Training Foundation, the ETF, um, to, to make sure that we get those opportunities to visit and be trained by industry to then enrich our curriculum. So we're using that to almost quality assure that our staff can deliver what the industry standards are so i think not not a yeah no, no silver bullet from from me on that front it's a work in progress for us but but it's that auditing process and making sure that i suppose the other side is is to make sure that our teachers feel supported in what is good practice when it comes to embedding careers into the curriculum because they are not and we shouldn't expect them to be career specialists but they want we want to have that careers awareness of, of what good looks like. So making sure that they have that support mechanism again through the different strands of our structure to actually deliver what is an impactful curriculum that prepares our young people for their lives in HE or in industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think it often is a case of nervousness and not feeling quite rightly that they understand about careers. So CPD obviously has a role in that as well. It's a bit like a carrot and a stick, isn't it, Tom? Would you like to come in there in terms of anything that you do it, it, with the academic staff and engaging them with, with careers? Um, so our, our big focus at the moment is is actually, actually as a school is looking at a deeper embedding of careers in the curriculum. Um, so we we run regular CPD with staff. So we do a termally careers focused CPD with the whole staff. Um, and then we also have uh, optional drop in CPD sessions uh, for any member. So with myself, uh, so much smaller seminar based approach to it uh, for any members of staff that would like advice or guidance or just general support on on not just embedding um, a career skills related uh, element to their to their curriculum, but also on advice on post 16 options. So um, a big question I asked a lot of my staff last week was what's the difference between a B tech, a T level and A level? Um, and actually, in terms of anything that's any more than superficial, there's a surprising number that weren't that, that didn't have anything more than that. Mm. Um, so that's that's a big focus on us. And then we also um, use the CDI framework for secondary and primary uh, as part of our auditing process, um, which, again, I'd strongly recommend. I think it's a, a really nice way to give that, as Ellis said, the golden thread or as we go with the Bailey for whatever your particular catch is for it is is that deeper enriching side of the curriculum that's beyond the qualification and actually the nitty gritty of what makes a subject for a teacher so passionate and so engaging. Mm. Um, so a big focus on that in particular and getting departments, giving departments dedicated time to sit down as a group um, where I can float between departments and, and mooch about to where they can actually discuss their curriculum from a skills and careers perspective more so than just the academic perspective I suppose absolutely and uh, working in higher education is a challenge as well across the you know, to get academic staff you know across across the wide range of education involved and really engaging with careers Janet you had your hand up there we were asking about um uh, the the gaps before and lessons basically and maybe if you've got some good practice that you've seen in terms of schools either auditing or encouraging it I think you're, you're on mute there Janet Apologise, I had to take a call from the doctors. They've been checking my iron levels again. Um, so just to say, with things like GATS before, I think it's important to remember and ensure your staff understand that it's not just careers directly related to their subject, 
that it is all the transferable skills that they are teaching. And that sometimes gets lost. They think, oh, we've got to give a, a career that this will automatically lead to. But if a kid doesn't like the subject, that's not going to help them engage. What needs to be done is, OK, you might not like my subject, but these are the things that might help you get a job in the future in the area you like because, for example, history, it's about those research skills. You know, English is about communication skills. This comes from an English teacher who had to teach kids way back who go, we don't need to fill in forms and read anything. We're going to go and work on the building sites, you know. And you've got to try and get the kids to think, what is it I'm being taught here that will help me? We're all very sort of selfish and individual. And if you can then get the teachers to do that, I know part of the problem with teachers is they love their subject. They like to talk about it and engage other people in it. But not everybody likes their subject. And how you have to learn that and then think, well, what's the things I'm teaching you that will help you? Is that okay? Wonderful. Thanks, Janet. And, and we're gonna we're gonna end the panel there. I will I'm just gonna do some reflection with John, but I will just come back to one of the points that Denise Manning made as well, which was around how do you quality assure things like speakers in assemblies? Now I'm sure we all have had that moment before where a speaker stood up in front of our sixth form or in front of our year 10s in assembly and we felt, you know, we're not sure whether this was as impactful as it could be. Perhaps they're not even sometimes very good speakers. And then you have that anxiety about that. Um, and I think, Denise, when, the only thing I can say is that with, with things like that, I think surveying learners, you know, learners will quite often tick if it's is it, was it useful or not. No. And and so I sometimes think focus groups are a better way um, of doing that. So and when I say focus groups, I mean, grabbing a few students in a corridor at the end of the lesson just to say, was that talk useful? How useful was it? And and recording some of those thoughts, some of those direct quotes from the learners, because um, but also trusting your own instincts. You know, your learners, if you didn't find it engaging, if you didn't find interesting you know look at their faces as well when the talk's being done and seeing if, if there's good levels of engagement it can be difficult we all know what teenagers are like but my just my advice there would be to perhaps go to them individually for actually a little bit of narrative about what they felt about it rather than surveying students they can feel a bit over surveyed sometimes and I think they're not always particularly honest in what what they're in, in answering questions so at this point, thank you very much to our panel. Um, it's just the last few minutes, and I'm hoping it won't take the full 15 and that you may be free, um, hopefully free to have a break as opposed to going to an afternoon of teaching or, or anything else. But um, we've got um, just a little bit of a, of a time to kind of think about what some of the themes are of the conference. Um, and I think obviously the, the theme that we sort of planted, I suppose, was this sense that we're all um, we've only got finite resources and actually the work of careers could be considered as being infinite. And so how do we manage that that difficulty? How do we manage that when we're talking about actually delivering careers to young people and what impact it has on them? How do we manage that discrepancy when we're thinking about ourselves and our own sense of professional worth and then extending that to our own mental health, how we are with our families? Um, it's an inexhaustive job. I suppose the theme that feels um, most pertinent or, or the advice that is strongly coming through from those speakers um, is that you sort of have to almost have a, a different mentality to that which you may have originally been comfortable with. You have to sort of, I think, generate a, a mentality that's more like being a CEO, that is more about um, rising above, seeing the bigger picture, delegating, having honest conversations with other people who can have impact, who can who can make things happen. So rather than thinking constantly, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, it's maybe about um, taking yourself one step away and identifying um, what you can you do and what can you do that has the most impact. And very often that is having those conversations with other people, that is expanding your team if at all possible. Um, it is you know, helping um, to get academic departments or pastoral teams engage with careers more effectively so that careers is being done in a much broader way and is not just coming all the way through one person. And to echo what John said, we've got this two-tiered problem. We've got this problem that 
careers advisors are being asked or careers professionals, careers leaders, careers coordinators are being asked to do a significant amount of work and that their workload is very high. But also we're aware and we're acknowledging that careers professionals are in very short supply. There aren't many of us that have experience, that have qualifications. And so I think we do have to get better, which again, may be against our nature, with advocating for ourselves and saying, actually, you know, you to some extent, you need me, you need my expertise, you need my knowledge. And therefore, you know, you are going to have to accept these limitations of what I do, or you're going to have to listen to me because I'm actually making a strong statement that this is needed for our young people. This is required. I've looked at, you know, perhaps you've had the quality and career standard and you've got recommendations to work through. Perhaps you've got a friendly governor. Perhaps you can compare the provision at your school with a school of a similar size and comment on how better they are resourced. And it's about sort of making that case for yourself because you are that one person in school. And it's hoped that the, the, the wider staff do appreciate your role and understand it. They certainly will find it quite hard to replace you. So I don't know whether that's something, John, that kind of strikes with you, but I think that's kind of the theme that seems to be coming coming through the conference with me. Absolutely. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. And I, I think that's it because, you know, the, as remind ourselves of what we were trying to look at today. So we're looking at, you know, the cost for an outstanding careers provision. And again, we were looking at this from, from two angles. Mainly we've been focusing, of course, on cost in terms of well-being and cost in terms of strain and cost in terms of demands for the role. And I think, you know, we've all provided all the speakers, I, I feel, have done an excellent job in helping us to, to give us some strategies, really, to, to take away from that. I, I will just reflect for, for, a, for a second on, on the financial cost as well, because I do think it's important to recognise that because, you know, we are underfunded as a, as a career service. The young person's aspect of it is is grossly underfunded. So it's about you know recognizing those limitations and and realizing what we can and can't do. So it's part of that picture. So yeah, no, I think I think we've had some some excellent uh, sessions this 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 morning. Um, and what we'll do is we'll upload all these uh, aspects to to the uh, to the website, the recordings, and the slides used and things like that too. And, you know, but it's about looking at things, you know, as Tom said, it's about we can ask for more time. Nobody else is really going to blow our own, our own trumpet. With with Ellis, it's about trying to find those allies from within, you know, and, and really kind of utilising that. And, and Tom talked about that too. Janet's session was really helpful to identify that, you know, the, the quality and career standard is, is an award and it's a process and it will provide some work as well as cost. But you will also through it have an advocate for your careers program and something that that might in you know, some of those recommendations that she shared there that, that could be quite typical could well be a, a really supporting part too so i think all i wanted to, to kind of finish with personally to say is is a huge thank you first of all to our to our speakers you know without you you know it couldn't have been possible today um so really really um grateful to that as well obviously to yourself Jenny for, for doing an excellent job in, in comparing today and Ellen that isn't on you can't see her on the on the conference but she's been doing all the hard work behind the scenes so I'm incredibly grateful to to everybody that's contributed today least of all of course you know most of all of course to anybody that's been attending that's given up your time so the last thing I'd say is is please do keep engaging with us I want to just finish by saying that we are listening. We do hear. So just let us know what you're experiencing and if there's anything that we can do to support. We do have these conferences biannually. So the next one will be about April, May time. And just let us know what you need. What would you like to hear more of? What would you like to hear less of kind of thing? And we'll definitely be, be receptive to, to, to those. But... I make it about seven minutes to one o'clock. So I think you've probably all um, earned yourself a, a nice earlier finish. What I'd, a final, final, final plea would be, certainly if you can between now and half term, see if you can book yourself out that personal meeting that I saw in the chat referred to as. I really like that. Maybe just an hour or something to start with, but just book it out in work time 
to clear that headspace and to, to put things into perspective and into a plan uh, and maybe start to take some of Ed's advice about, well, how can you actually start to construct this towards, you know, um, the start of a journey towards um, more resources, more support, more more of a role. So Lovely. I, I leave things there. Sorry, Thank ben. you very much to you as well, John. You must take credit for this. And thanks, everyone, for coming. So please look out for our recordings on social media. And again, please do post if you've got any comments on social media. We'd love to hear from you there. Thanks very much.